Okay. Welcome. I'm so glad that you were able to make it in. We've been anticipating talking with you for a couple years. Um, just a few disclaimers before we get started uh, to remind you that this is not a private conversation and ultimately we will be made available to the public. Uh, we want to, this to be a fun experience for you, so if at any point it becomes less than fun, just let me know and we'll change topics or uh, take a break, um, <coughs> whatever's necessary. Uh, and my role in the conversation is to talk as little as possible um, and let you tell your story with me just guiding here and there and asking some follow-ups, but um, my silence does not indicate that I am not paying attention. Okay, so the, to formally begin, today is Thursday, September 12th, 2019. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I'm interviewing Henry Kahn here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before beginning, if I can just get your verbal uh, consent that you are aware and allow this to be recorded. Absolutely, I'm aware. Okay. Okay, so um, as I think... Uh, we, we warned you, uh, this is a bit of a life history, so we're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, if you can uh, describe a bit about when and where you were born. Well, I can't firsthand remember it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the legend? The, I was born during a uh, air raid blackout in Hudson Valley in New York State, um, the middle of World War II, 1943, May. My mother was... Um, obviously pregnant, mm -hmm. posting nine weeks, nine months rather, I know this, <laughs> nine months, um, but my father was on active duty in the U.S. Army, um, as befits, mm -hmm. uh, reasonably healthy, and there's lots of stories there, but and so she was living uh, alone in Poughkeepsie, but not far from her parents who lived down the block uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York. They were Russian Jewish immigrants who had come separately from the same city, Bialystok, um, around 1904. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we could go into how they wound up in Poughkeepsie. It's a peculiar story, totally random, but Poughkeepsie is where they had set up finally a, a, a residence uh, and a small business, and where my f mother returned from her college education the first in her SIF ship to go to college. And then she married this Joe Kahn, my father, a poor kid from the tenements of the Lower East Side, New York City. Um, and he moved up to Poughkeepsie to improve his life. Mm -hmm. um, but he got drafted, we'll get there. So I was born then, the tale goes, my grandfather had to pick her up and drive with all the lights out in the middle of the night to the hospital because at Poughkeepsie, there was a, a critical railroad bridge crossing over the Hudson River. A large part of the commercial transfer between New England and the Midwest goes right across there, rather than coming through New York City. So anyway, it's, it's a tactical kind of, There never was any bombing by the Germans, but it's sort of interesting tale. Um, so I was born there in the Catholic hospital because Jews were not admitted to the general hospital in Vassar Brothers Hospital in Poughkeepsie, New York. You've heard of Vassar? Yeah. Same family, right? Um, well, Jews could have gotten in, but Jewish doctors could not, so the Jewish obstetrician who delivered my mother got me uh, in the Catholic hospital, a much smaller institution. I, it, I, it's interesting. I'll just touch on it because um, a few years later, very few years later, less than two, I had some of the earliest memories of my life, not the earliest, but some of the, the closest, the earliest of being terrified in a hospital bed and seeing these women in habits, big black habits, rather firm, non-smiling approach to a two-year-old infant a child uh, for a minor surgical procedure that I had at that time. Um, so, again, dependent on the Catholic hospital, which mm -hmm. otherwise wouldn't be where our family would have gone. Mm -hmm. anyway, so I was born in Poughkeepsie, New York, and um, shortly after the birth... And what was the precise date, May the... My birthday? Yes. May 6, May 6, 43. 
but I know that in the following year, I can't tell you exactly when, uh, my mother moved to what they call Mount Rainier, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., to join her husband, who had been stationed um, basically at the Pentagon, what was the predecessor of the Pentagon. And there's a long story there, but in any case, more of my earliest memories are there in a garden apartment, low-end garden apartments that were filled with junior officers serving their country in the middle of World War II, not in the trenches. Mm -hmm. um, so I lived there until shortly after the war was over, and then we returned to Poughkeepsie. Um, I, would, I welcome you to talk about some of these background and, and backstories that you alluded to. Sort of my next line of questioning in my notes is, the origin of your grandparents and parents, how your parents met, mm -hmm. and the, the work and class backgrounds of your, your family. Both, all, of my, all four of my grandparents uh, were very poor immigrant Jews from Eastern Europe, arriving basically the first decade of the last century. And, uh, my mother's family came from what was then Russia, it's now Poland, Bialystok, but it had renowned for a very large and prosperous Jewish ghetto. Didn't mean everybody was prosperous in it, but there was a, there was a cultured place. Um, my father's family came from Sigitumaris, which is now in Romania, but was in Hungary. Much smaller town, very small, but still had a Jewish ghetto. I have since met people from that town, young people, in my adult life, I met a young postdoctoral fellow from that town in, in Romania. She barely knew that it had once been in Hungary. Um, and when she probed to learn about who were my grandparents, she said, I don't think that's possible. She said, there are no Jews in Sigitu <laughs> mm -hmm. Um Interesting. <laughs> Right, um, but that but we only had a minor Jewish identification. Um, although my paternal grandmother <clears throat> was quite orthodox in her beliefs and practices, I only saw her a few times a year because she always lived, to my knowledge, in New York City in a small tenement, one two room apartment, oh, and there we observed kosher traditions and stuff. But not otherwise. Um, she was a very loving, kind woman, um, not a tyrant, um, but definitely but a strict believer. Mm -hmm. um, and you say that you saw her, was, was your grandfather deceased? Yes, my yes. grandfather's name was, in American English, Henry Kahn. He would not have recognized the name. His name was Chaim Kahn. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how or at what point it, it had to be Henry to get through some functions in New York City. And he died a few months before I was born. So that permitted me to have his name. In the Jewish tradition, you don't name somebody after a living person. Uh, if you know Jews who bear the same name as their father or mother, who hadn't a predeceased their birth. Um, they are definitely ignorant of Jewish, at least Ashkenazi traditions. Mm -hmm. Probably true of Sephardic Jews also. I think that is true. Um, anyway, not a big deal. My father's family, though, was di uh, different. Well, my mother's family migrated to Cleveland. The, the grandmother and grandfather knew each other as adolescents in Bialystok, but they found each other again when they separately migrated to Cleveland because of some, sh I'm not sure my grandmother went there, but my grandfather had a remote cousin. That she'll take care of, she'll sponsor you. <clears throat> but he was provoked to flee in the middle of the night from Bialystok after. He was 
on the young end of a nine or ten person sib ship, and all of his sibs, were, except him, were slaughtered by the Cossacks um, in his presence. He hid in the attic and was not seen. And, um, eventually came down and found his way to the port and left as a late teenager. Um, and then he found uh, Minnie, his, my grandmother, in Cleveland, or maybe she came later. I don't know which and how it worked. But they set up a small business um, bottling seltzer. Does this need an explanation? Put that tag in there, seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> It was a common and necessary drink in the, Ash in the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish immigrant community. Everybody drank seltzer, okay. carbonated water in right. a blue siphon bottle. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the Which small, has become popular again. Yeah, but it wasn't for many decades yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, that was his job. And my mother was born there. She was the second child, and there was... I guess it must have been a third child born there. And then when my mother was 10, she was awakened in the middle of the night by my grandfather and said, quiet, not a sound, don't speak. We're getting in the car and we're leaving tonight. Get, a, get your blanket and two pieces of clothes, get in the car. Um, and they just drove. And that, the story goes that my grandfather learned that the mafia had a price on his head because he had come to some they had come to a disagreement about this, the distribution of alcohol products from his seltzer wagon. Um, this is pro <laughs> prohibition. And uh, he had, I, I don't know any details, but somebody expected him to be delivering alcohol. And uh, my supposition is he probably did for a while. And then there was a disagreement about who gets paid. And he said, we're out of Cleveland. We're gone. And he just got in the car and drove, just drove as far as he could, and three nights later, he came, he was very tired, got into a small town, Poughkeepsie, <laughs> and saw a Jewish center. He said, this is a pretty town. It's cute, it's, it's nice. I don't know if he said cute, I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure he was speaking Yiddish at the time. Let's just stop here, I've, we've had it. This, we can be safe here. So the theme here is fleeing persecution. On the other side of my family, I'm not aware of any massive cataclysmic event like the Cossack invasion and, and slaughtering, but they obviously knew they needed to leave. My grandfather left. He was already married in Hungary. He left first after two kids, left two kids and a wife behind, um, found random jobs in New York without a hell of a lot of support. And then his wife, extremely courageous on her own, without his permission or invitation, just took the two kids and found her way in Steerage, New York City, and found him. And then had four more kids. And my father's the last of those kids. So my father was born in New York, but his older brothers, his two elder brothers, he has three elder brothers, but his two elder brothers were born in Hungary. They. Um, while grandmother on that side preserved her orthodox Judaism, my mother's parents could take it or leave it. They were more in the nature of assimilated bourgeois um, small business people mm -hmm. and preferred it that way. But they preserved a Jewish identity, but modestly, not, not observant, not rigorous. Uh, in my father's sipship, his eldest brother fled the family pretty much, not not violently, not not uh, cataclysmically or catastrophically, but basically he didn't hang around the house much in the tenements in the Lower East Side of New York, and he became streetwise and very sophisticated, and became a reporter for the New York Daily News, and <clears throat> um, without an advanced education, but spoke several languages. He, he was a sharp guy. Um, eventually became a, a columnist for the New York Daily News, pretending to be Charlie Knickerbocker. Um, the street scene in New York, 
told in the 1930s by a streetwise. I don't know, the Bill Thorpey of his day. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. And he pretty much rejected the, the orthodoxy. Didn't come home much. Mm. Um, lived sort of on his own. The subsequent kids were more conventional, but they had a flavor. They knew that Brother Gordon, the eldest, had made an independent statement. My father, the youngest, I think must have loved or admired his elder brother, but they were 12 years apart, so we didn't see much of it. My father went to a progressive elementary school in the Lower East Side, a product of the settlement house tradition mm -hmm. for the poor immigrant kids, most unusual. Um, and um, they studied literature. They did plays. They had Ilbert and Sullivan operettas. <laughs> it, um, it stunned me when I it was in high school and doing my own Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. It stunned me. My father knew these things from the age of eleven. You know, he had experienced that in elementary school, not like most of the inner city slum schools at that mm -hmm. time. But he wanted to be a literature student and floated the idea that he wanted to go to college and his mother and father mixed it. How are you going to make money as an English major? What, what, do I, do I need to tell you this? Sounds so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, and you know, we need the money. You can't, you can't do that. So they came to a compromise. He could go to college only if he went to night school, had a job, and studied something that would prepare him for, a, for income. So he did eight years of night school to study bookkeeping and accounting. And he was a, a night school student at City College in New York and lived under the discipline of his mother's household. His father was there, but I gather he was an absent man a lot. What, what did his father do to earn a living? Uh, at many occasions, I think nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know exactly. But the only occupation that I heard about repeatedly that he was a, a tanner dealing with the, the skins mm -hmm. of cows, basically for the early stage of producing shoes. And so his job was basically to wear big boots wading in vats of sulfuric acid with a long pole and stirring these very large pieces of cattle's hide in the sulfuric acid. How he, he died, probably in his 50s, I don't know what his age was at death, but uh, it was shortly before I was born. And I'm one of the elder of his grandchildren, but he's had, not the oldest, but the fourth or fifth out of 15 or something. <clears throat> Told he just he fell and um, got very sick and died. If I fell in a vat of sulfuric acid, I'd be very sick too. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know what. Nobody seems to know. There were no medical records. Not yeah. um, so I'm his. So he was the only grandfather, grandparent I didn't know. <clears throat> so my father. Uh, this is it relevant, and it goes back to the circumstances of my, mo uh, my mother giving birth in the middle of World War II and then moving to Maryland, where my father was a lieutenant in the Army. How did that happen? Well, he wasn't a lieutenant originally. He, was dra he had had very few experiences outside of New York City in his youth. He was a night, school, night student at CCNY. City College of mm -hmm. New York. It's not unlike the situation of many Georgia State students who work hard and go to night school or something like that. Um, he got drafted um, and sent him. He did have a few weekends off in his eight years of night school, or maybe near the very end when he actually graduated and had his first job. And with a bunch of buddies, they got they rented, borrowed a car or something. Maybe, I don't know, and took a weekend up in the country in Hopewell Junction, New York, which is near Poughkeepsie, where there was a Jewish camp called Kinderland. 
well, that was the, the children's camp version. But yeah. Associated with it was a small resort where working class Jewish people, often single, could come and have a cabin for the weekend, mm -hmm. swim in a pond, and then go back to New York. He did that, and he met the woman who was driving the seltzer truck, delivering seltzer to this resort. And my mother, on her summer vacation from college, I had to work for her father, and she was ahead of the curve. She drove a truck and, and delivered seltzer to the camp. My father was there as an overnight guest, met this woman, and the rest got into a modest courtship, and then they got married. Only were allowed to get married only because of the war, because he was about to get drafted. And on, but for that fact, Irma Lottie would not have permitted him to get married because his older sisters were not yet married. And there had to be a sequence. But because there was a war, and because Yossi, Joseph, my, my father, was about to go into the army, we'll make an exception. We'll, we'll let him marry, um, even though um, Lily and Esty are not yet married. So he, the youngest, got married. Um, in the war, and then departed for basic training. So that was his next experience outside of New York City. <laughs> he went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He'd never been to New Jersey before. Okay, so this is the constricted life of immigrant kids. We don't have to, I don't have to bel belabor that and some of the similarities to the modern era. Um, and while he was there in basic training, he got called out of infantry. Um, Private Khan, come to the sergeant's office. You know, so we have news for you. You're not going to be in infantry anymore. And he didn't get it. He didn't. He, they said, "There's a serious war going on, and we need a finance corps." And word has come down that we are to find anybody who has certification in economics or accountancy, and we're creating a finance corps to buy things for the army. We've never had one before. You know. And, and you've been nominated to go to Officer Candidate School. He had no clue what that meant. And so uh, an Aggie got to go to North Carolina. He handed his rifle and go to Wake Forest University, which was a very, he, he described to me how stunned he was. He'd never seen all those trees uh, uh, and um, all these southern girls who talk funny. <laughs> Uh, he was an officer candidate school in a very privileged environment. This is all relevant to my political development because although yeah. he was a bourgeois kid at best, junior bourgeois wannabe, <laughs> and that era, the finance corps was largely composed of PhD young men. I say that advisedly, mm -hmm. men, with recent PhDs from. University of Chicago, Yale, Harvard, and almost all of them were socialists or communists, happy to serve the country. Mm -hmm. they, they were motivated to join the war, but they also had a very left-wing perspective. Uh, he came out of training as a CP, uh, to become a CPA at City College, um, but he found himself in the dormitory with people who were different and whose intellectual interests seemed to correspond with his older brother, George uh, Gordon. They had some things in common. Gordon had acquired a, a left-wing perspective that was common to the writers and thinkers mm -hmm. of the 30s. Um, so when my father mustered out of the service, he returned to Poughkeepsie, but he was a different man and he was not the docile junior accountant in his father-in-law's seltzer shop. <laughs> and that was the trajectory that he was supposed to be on. Yeah. Uh, he, had all, he moved into a private practice of accountancy to get out from under his father-in-law, but the marriage deteriorated rapidly in the late 40s and early 50s, largely around the political Incompatibility. Mm. And what are what are your parents' names? 
My father was Joseph Kahn. Mm -hmm. My mother's Selma Schlachter. S-C-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R. A sim symptom of the era. <clears throat> My name at birth was originally Henry Schlachter Kahn. My parents agreed within a few days that that was not a good idea. It's too complicated for the new country. So they truncated my middle name to Slater. So my name is Henry Slater, S-L-A-T-E-R, Khan, absent two C's and two H's, okay? Schlachter means slaughterer, butcher, in German and Yiddish. Um, you know that Yiddish is a mm -hmm. variant of high German. Anyway, so I am not Schlachter, I am Slater. Slater is my middle name. And I'm one of the few people in history whose grandparents are named after the grandbaby. My grandparents thought that was a great idea. And after my being named Sl Slater, they changed their name from Schlachter to Slater. Oh, wow. Okay, and that may have assisted their bourgeois rise. I doubt it, but it, it, they thought that was important. Mm -hmm. and so they were named after me. And when they had moved from Cleveland, is that correct, to Poughkeepsie, he reestablished yeah, he, the he, same he, business, right, Seltzer right. business. Right. Um, later, can I say this in the land of Coca-Cola? I know where I am right now. <laughs> he later acquired the sweetening uh, tag on his Seltzer business and couldn't afford the fruit franchise for Coca-Cola, which he knew was the big one. <laughs> Uh, so we got the Royal Crown Cola mm -hmm. and the Nehi franchise, and so became a distributor of sweetened beverages. I, you will learn, am an epidemiologist, largely in the nutritional field, in the diabetes division at CDC, and I don't have a warm spot in my heart for sweetened beverages. <laughs> I don't. We don't need to redact that in this context, but right, right. I'm now retired from Emory, I mean Coca-Cola, I mean Emory University. Uh, right. Um, Life is complicated. Yeah. In fact, I have a recollection in, a decade later in when I was visiting, when I was with my grandfather, not a decade, I was probably six, and I had done a good job picking up trash in his yard or something, I don't know. He said, good boy, he had a thick Jewish accent, good boy, I will take you for a treat. And we got in his car and we drove a little ways out into the country. And he said, I'm going to get you a Coca-Cola. <laughs> Funny. Right. Anyway, so yeah. It was touching. Yeah. So my father was moving steadily to the left in the period when the McCarthy period was emerging and the hazards of being a left winger were great. He was a member of the conservative synagogue in Poughkeepsie. There were several synagogues. There was a the Jewish presence, not massive, but you know, three synagogues, basically a conservative in the middle, an Orthodox and a Reform. He was in the middle and uh, was active enough to show up there a number of times a year. but. In the period of the late 40s and early 50s, he recommended that the Jewish community should do more to help solve the racial disparities in Poughkeepsie. And he was not appreciative for that. He invited blacks to ecumenical services in the synagogue, and he was expelled summarily from the synagogue. Um, not clearly just for that, but for the hazard that having a leftist in our congregation represents. We, we've suffered enough from political persecution. Don't make it worse by, by being mistaken for a communist. Um, but he was angry about that, well, but um, he took it. Also in my home in Poughkeepsie, he took in, we had black visitors, black guests, um, my mother, who played the piano, was encouraged by my father to accompany black singers 
vocalizing or singing spirituals. <laughs> um, we had a secular Seder, Passover Seder service in our house that my father designed long before he was aware of it being done anywhere else, celebrating the important things of the Passover service about escape from bondage, freedom, justice, which is what Passover is supposed to be all about. And early on, we invited our neighbor Pete Seeger to come. Pete Seeger became a close friend of my father's. Uh, they shared a political viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Pete Seeger lived in New Beacon, New York, which is in the same county as Poughkeepsie, about 14, 15 miles away, and came up to our house for Seder and for some other occasions as a visitor. Um, and I can't say that I knew Pete Seeger well, but certainly he knew, he knew who I was, and he knew my father well. He's in, he was about a decade younger than my father, but uh, they were good friends. Um, and he knew me. I mean, in later years, I would go backstage when Pete Seeger was playing anywhere near Atlanta, and uh, he would greet me and we, you know, discuss old times. Mm -hmm. uh, a good influence. When I was probably in high school, I had some occasion to go to New York, and part of the package got me to New York was to see Pete Seeger at Carnegie Hall. It, you may know that was a Pete Seeger's almost gave an annual Carnegie Hall concert. It was a big deal in New York pop culture, pop culture. And I got a ticket and I went, and I was thrilled. Pete Seeger sang. A song in Yiddish. Not that I was into Yiddish. I really don't know Yiddish, but I knew he was singing Yiddish. Chad Gadio. It's about the little goat. It's a song that's a tradition of the Passover Seder. Um, um, about the travails of being a little, a little goat and they get slaughtered, basically. <laughs> um, but he, on the stage of Carnegie Hall, thanked my father. He said, I learned this from my friend Joe Kahn at the Passover Seder. Secular Seder in Poughkeepsie, you know. Uh, woo! Um, not, I mean, I, he was not, not a stranger. He, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, so that was an environment in which I was percolated, but it was not easy for my father because I would go with him to his little office in a small uh, frame building in downtown Poughkeepsie. Not, not a big town, you know. And he would go pick up his mail at his post office box, and the post office was three block walk from his office to the post office and back. And if I would go with him on Saturday, you know, I didn't have school, and get get Henry out of the house, <laughs> take him. Down. He would walk over there and say, "Just hold my hand, hold my hand. If anything happens, you can just hold my hand. You're safe." And on one of those occasions, this guy has come out of the post office building with a snap brim hat, tight little suit, buzz cut. Um, Mr. Khan, we want to talk to you. Mr. Khan, we want to talk to you. You know why we want to talk to you. And he would say, I have nothing to say to you. I have nothing to say to you. He would hold my hand. And, you know. So this, this was surveillance going on um, in the McCarthy period uh, um, in small town upstate New York. These were, I mean, my father clarified for me that these were the FBI. And they were not happy. They, they wanted to, they were basically terrorizing left-wingers. Now, I have two questions I wanted to follow up on. Um, first, you mentioned your father and mother hosting, you know, interracial gatherings at their house um, and developing a, a race consciousness. Is there any relation or evolution in the thinking from when he went to officer training school here in the South? Did he? I don't know. Uh, he must have been aware of racial segregation. He was observant, you know, mm -hmm. but he was more impressed with the funny way these girls talked. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. He was a married man. I, I don't know what was on his mind. He did not mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be. That, that's an interesting thought. Um, and then also, with the 
the surveillance that he was under, <clears throat> and you mentioning him hosting these gatherings and, and being uh, having a leftist politics, uh, what other involvement in organizations or campaigns or do you well, think might have drawn attention or was it just merely that he's socializing with certain people? No, no I'm sure there was more. Um, uh, the only name that I recall hearing from time to time was the IWO, International Workers Order. I have occasionally gone into books to look it up and understand more about it. This is not the same as IWW, mm -hmm. but sympathetic actually. It was a group of mostly trade unionists who were primarily immigrant and mostly Jewish, but not necessarily. And they were um, communist sympathizer groups. Not the same as the Communist Party, but they were progressive left-wing trade unionists. Mm -hmm. And I remember he would be raising money for the burial plots for the IWO and raising money for maybe a flag or a banner or something, but small stuff, you know. And so I would know some of his friends were house painters and uh, masons and stuff like that who had sort of crafts, trades. And to the extent there was unions for those trades, they were active in the unions. And my father tried to support them. There was no union for accountants, uh, for public accountants, um, but he would help them out. Um, the other crucial thing is that um, basically he said to me when I probed to ask him more as I got older, like junior high school, high school, uh, I said, are you a member of the Communist Party? Because I heard bad things about the Communist Party. And he said, I really don't want to discuss it. It's best you don't know. It's my simple answer. So you don't know. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and I accepted that in many levels. Uh, you know. Um, so I, I learned not to ask. However, I know that many of his friends were communists. I learned subsequently. and. Um, I presume that in some manner or another he was connected to communist movement, but that, so were lots of people in that period, and many of them had to be fearful of it. Um, I can recall some speakers from New York City who came up and stayed at our house and gave a talk in our living room, and 12 people attended. They were left-wing intellectuals. One of them I know was a communist. Others might have been. I, that's basically what it was like in that period. Um, so I was aware of the fear factor as much as the explicit membership factor. Um, I have great respect for who those people were. I understand now, based on the subsequent decades of revelations about international communism, that there were some blind spots and some failure to see other things. But basically, they were doing wonderful things that other people weren't doing, and at peril, uh, like racial integration, like trade union building, um, like peace. Like, I mean, they were aware of nuclear weapons. Um, when I, no, the key thing in my personal history was a divorce that popped up. In the I was going to ask about your mom, yeah. how she felt about these. Mm, she mm. was out in outer space. I mean, that's not good. That's out, out to lunch. Uh, not awake, not engaged. She had, despite her having had a college education, it was a teacher's college education. And, and what school was that? that she she went to. <coughs> live in a dorm at Albany State Teachers College. Her parents, her older, she was the second child of three. Her older brother was sleepy, saw no reason to go to college because his father wanted him to just stay and help run the shop. She, the rebel who drove the seltzer truck, <laughs> said, I want to go to college. And father said, you can't do that because your brother didn't go. Why would you go? And she fought for it, and her brother subsequently went. 
and he went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. But she got her degree first, but it had to be in something that you can use for an income. So she got her degree in business education, and the rest of her life she taught typing and shorthand in high schools. Was how she how to type and how to take shorthand girls' skills? Mm -hmm. uh, was she working as, as you were a young child? No. no. She was an occasional substitute, but mm -hmm. not regularly. Um, but she also had a minor in music because she thought she liked playing the piano. She was terrible. She was not a good pianist, but she didn't know that. No one told her. And she played piano. And, she, and piano is just like typing, so I, I, I think I can do that. Her piano playing was just like typing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she enjoyed it. Yeah, she did. Um, so anyway, she didn't get it, and she fell under the influence of the conservative Jews, I mean, politically speaking, <coughs> Jews in the community, <coughs> who were pretty tough, hard-ass, nouveau bourgeois group, many of them also from immigrant families. Yeah. <coughs> Do you think lawyers. she aspired to... That sort of respectability and to be involved in, in social clubs and exactly. benevolent organizations and no, not, not so benevolent. Or not so benevolent. Right, exactly. And my father's story, I never heard this from my mother, but I believe my father's rendition. He said, I knew the marriage was going badly. This is decades later, he shared this with me, close to his deathbed. I knew the marriage was going badly. I loved my two children. I have a younger sister, so I had a son and a daughter, three years apart. The classic new family. <clears throat> I was not going to give you up. Um, I didn't see anything uh, but to just go ahead with a loveless marriage and be the support of my two kids. Um, and that's what I was going to do. Nobody prepared me for the possibility, he said, that I would get a phone call from Daniel Rosen, I think it was Sam Rosen, a uh, prominent Jewish lawyer in the Gipsy. He says, come down to my office, I got something to tell you. He knew, him, he, you know, it was a public, a CPA in the largely Jewish small town community. He knew who the big lawyers were, the big doctors were. <laughs> so he says, sit down, Joe. He said, um, I'm serving you with papers. Your wife is filing for divorce. Um, and he was stunned. He said, I had no clue this was coming. But he said, basically, his father-in-law and the uh, conservative community Jewish leaders said, get this commie out of our community. Yeah. So um, they went through the motions of getting a divorce. I mean, they did, which I'm told, I don't understand this, but required that just, they had to live in different states for one year before it could be official. I don't, it's the arcane divorce law is unknown to me, but it may be easier now, but that's what they did then. And so we picked up, my mother, my sister, and I were moved to Hollywood, Florida. Talk about yanked away. Because that was the place to which my grandfather had retired. So, and in the late 1940s, he was old enough to retire. He had a small nest egg, and he heard that there was real estate deals to be made in South Florida, and he bought a small eighth of an acre plot um, and became a minor contractor on his own. He built two or three other houses, and he even built a small business office for rental to businesses in Hollywood, Florida. And that was his retirement. And we went there to visit on two or three consecutive years, and suddenly we went there to live. Um, and was his wife still alive? Yeah, so yeah. grandfather and grandmother lived together in retirement for another 20 years there. And I don't know if it was 20, something like that. And your, your so mother's brother? He lived there too. He, the wimpy, uh, passive son, uh, it followed. He went there and became a fuller brush salesman in, I was gonna, in, in Hollywood, Florida. Because after going to Rensselaer, did he, 
he went back to the family business and always never became an engineer. Close. Never, never <laughs> stayed close to the family. Yeah, yeah, right. And he lived four blocks away in his own house, had his own wife, his own two kids. <clears throat> and shortly thereafter, my mother's younger sister, who went to Cornell and was a home ec major at Cornell, which is a state school, actually an ag school, you may know, as well as our Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. And she moved there too. Um, bourgeois husband, and so they all were there, so it was a natural place for my mother to disappear to. So we stayed in, we lived in a small apartment, um, again within five blocks of the other family, and I went every day to Hollywood Central School. Hollywood, Florida, now I'm told there's a half a million people in it, it it's, and it goes for miles and miles and miles. That was not the case in 1953. Yeah, they were really on the cutting edge. It, it was tiny. It had, I think, 18,000 people in the winter time, and far less in the summer. And was there much of a Jewish community? The, there's once in the Gog, and it was across the street from the public school, which, <clears throat> which was all white. Um, so there was, you know, Jewish community, salted by a fair number of retirees, <clears throat> and um, I was within a, a three-block walk of the public school and the synagogue. Um, you know, I had to cross from Guan, but then after that, if you go any further to the west, there's one more block, one more block, then the railroad, everything else is just jungle. Uh, it's just, uh, just the palmetto scrub, for the, as far as I can see. There's only eight blocks to downtown Hollywood, and the tallest building at that point in downtown Hollywood was the Slater building that my grandfather built. It was two, two stories. <laughs> Nothing, right? And that, I went to fifth grade there. That was my fifth grade experience, um, during which Brown versus Topeka was uh, issued. The, the, <clears throat> the Supreme Court mandate that separate but equal was false. You have, it cannot be separated any longer. And I remember being out in my playground that day that the news came out and the kids were yelling and screaming, I ain't gonna let no niggers come into my school. This, they can't, and these are the Jewish kids. They can't do this to us. Who will they tell me who I go to school with? They can't tell me this kind of stuff. Fifth was, graders. Fifth graders. Yeah. I knew better. In fact, I was already asking a lot of questions. Why are there different water fountains in the train station? We went by train, that's how we got back and forth. Um, why are there different waiting rooms? So these things caught my attention and I was not happy with it. So I only lived there one year uh, and then came back. To, my mother decided to get her master's degree and improve her prospects for education. So she went to Teachers College in New York and we lived on 121st Street, right on the edge of Harlem, um, in a grad student housing. while she finished her master's degree. And that permitted us to take weekends in Poughkeepsie to visit our father, who would pick us up at the train station. My, I was 10 or 11, my sister was uh, seven or eight in that year that we lived on the edge of Columbia University. Um, after the first couple of trips to Poughkeepsie in which my mother accompanied us on the bus, we didn't have a car or anything like that, we got on the bus across 125th Street Crosstown bus, get on the New York Central Railroad that had 125th Street station on the Hudson River line going north up Hudson River. And she put us on the train and my father would pick us up an hour and a half, two hours later in Poughkeepsie. We'd get off and we'd, he'd be on the, on the platform waiting for us. No, no going through TSA security, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the way it is. And after the first couple of trips, we did it on our own. My mother didn't even take us at the station. Me, age 11, my sister, age 8, we'd get on the 125th Street Crosstown bus, take the bus across Harlem, get off Lexington Avenue where the, hundred, the railroad station was, walk up the stairs, buy a ticket, yep. and get on the train, and get off in Poughkeepsie six stops later. Um, can you imagine 
my mother would be guilty of child cruelty if she put an eight-year-old on the train on the, on the bus to go across Harlem. It was fine. We had no problems. Mm -hmm. I was comfortable with everybody else on this bus was black. It wasn't a problem. It was a nice experience. Um, so you know, that, that very different than Hollywood, Florida. Uh, yes. <laughs> The few blacks I saw would avert their eyes and step off the curb in Hollywood. It was just scary to see that. I mean, I, I don't mean I was scared. I just was troubled. It was not a pleasant thing. My grandfather, who although we on, on one of those occasions took me out to get a Coca-Cola, otherwise if he thought I needed some disciplining because I didn't have a father in the house, on one occasion, he took me down to the state of Florida traveling trailer exhibit of how justice works in Florida. And there was a trailer parked on Hollywood Boulevard. Boulevard. <laughs> they were, this is all hype and promo. There's a, 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 a towed trailer parked in there, and you go in and see pictures of jails and pictures of of what happens in pictures of an electric chair. And this, if, you, if you're really bad, that's what happens to you. And I can't remember the racial explicit content in it, but I had a clear sense that that's what happened to black people. It wouldn't happen to me. But that was the, the display for the public on Hollywood Boulevard. That the state had erected. It, it towed in. They, called, to, they must tow it from village to village. A, a, a display of seeing what an electric chair looks like, you better pay attention. You know. um, anyway, we came back to a slightly more benign environment. Had a cosmopolitan friends in New York City. The grad, grad student housing included one of my best friends was, I can't remember her first name. I mean, it was sixth grade. Mm -hmm. She was just a friend. Mm -hmm. It was an Arabic name, but her last name was Nasser. She was from Baghdad. Her father was a graduate student there, right? It's, it's, there were international students staying there. She was a nice girl, smiley, funny, good to talk to, you know. And so I had friends who were cosmopolitan, Origins. A Danish student family was there. You know, there's. Um, that's interesting. I can't remember her first name, but I'm sure I didn't call her Nasser. Nasser was her last name. I called her Sa Sarah or something. Mm -hmm. It might have been Sarah. You know, that was an improvement over Hollywood, Florida. And plenty of American kids from other environments. A kid from a farm in Idaho. So and you were going to New York City public schools? No. No. Uh, um, not only was that uh, cosmopolitan housing, but we attended school in the practice school of New York, uh, Columbia Teachers College, mm -hmm. which was a pretty progressive, reasonable place. One year there, and then my mother got a job teaching high school in New Paltz, New York, which is 10 miles from Poughkeepsie. So it was convenient for taking the bus back and forth to Poughkeepsie, not far from her home turf. My father, for reasons I don't understand, did, st I guess because he felt he had a practice that he had built up. <coughs> <coughs> he may have felt too insecure to start fresh as a tagged left winger. <coughs> he did have a small left community that supported him to some degree, or he supported them. I think he was more financially successful than the house painters and the masons that we knew. But you know, mm -hmm. Pete Seeger was not a, a famous um, musician at the time. He was a a, a, a nice, um, largely unemployed folk singer. <laughs> so um, went back to went to New Paltz and lived there for. I went there for two years, but I had arrived at New Paltz Central School, and um, where there also was a teacher's college at the time. It's now State University of New York at New Paltz, a massive campus. Then there was a small teacher's college. So I went to the practice school there. So I went to a bunch of practice schools. I'll get back to that in a minute. It was helpful. 
but just I was only there for the, 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 my discharge papers at the practice school at Columbia Teachers College, the one that accompanied me to New Pulse, said, you might consider him for promotion the great ahead. <laughs> um, and they didn't take it seriously until about a week into school. They said, yeah, <laughs> we're going to put you up a grade ahead. So, I, so you skipped the sixth I, grade? I skipped uh, seventh grade okay. and did, went right into eighth grade instead. Mm -hmm. I was sixth grade in New York City, fifth grade in Hollywood, Florida, sixth right. grade in New York City, eighth and ninth grade in New Paltz. But my um, prospects for going to high school were scary. Uh, staying in New Paltz was not uh, great. Uh, I, could, I could argue my mother taught there, that wasn't cool. And my stepfather, she had remarried briefly, and it was a failed marriage, but he taught there too. <coughs> and I, I expressed some discomfort about that. And um, my father was thinking that his kids were being abandoned from the enriched life he wanted us to have. And so he came, he remarried, <coughs> had a much better marriage with a woman whom I consider to be the rock for me. She had never had children, never married before, but she was a free-living Greenwich Village, quiet, bohemian type of woman that he met uh, because she was the sister of one of my father's political friends in Poughkeepsie. And they were a great marriage. It was good. She was, she gave up her sophisticated Greenwich Village life to come to Poughkeepsie and support this nice, thoughtful, humble accountant in Poughkeepsie who had two kids that she liked. So it was good. If I'm tearing up, it's because I really did like her. Yeah. Um, but did she work outside the home or was uh, your... She did, but uh, she didn't have a formal professional uh, accreditation. Um, she was a great typist, um, and her brother-in-law in Poughkeepsie was an orthodontist who uh, needed a secretary or an appointment clerk, so he, he she would help her. She would help him out and do a few other small jobs, mm -hmm. and basically was a housewife and a wonderful mother, um, and also very respectful of my mother's privilege as a real mother, and tried not to. Uh, displace her. But she did, in my heart. Mm. Um, so my father worked out a deal to, I think, maybe the kids should come to the bigger town and come to Poughkeepsie, but not Poughkeepsie High School. So we came and I entered a Quaker school in Poughkeepsie. There was a very well-established small boarding school called Oakwood Friends School. Well, we just call it Oakwood School. It's an Oakwood School. It was founded in 1796, had blacks enrolled the very first year of its founding in 1796. Quakers do a pretty goddamn good job, you know. And so I became a, a tenth grader at Oakwood School and was a day student. I lived at home three miles away, easy commute. Occasionally would bike it. Usually someone would drive me out there. <coughs> and I went to Quaker School for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and that saved my ass. They were very gracious. I mean, there were privileged kids there and stuff. There, there were black kids there who were generally more privileged than me. These were black Republican kids from the South who, <laughs> yeah, who went to a Quaker school in the North to get plugged in for good college education, you know. But it was a nice environment. I had good friends there. Didn't have to be in ROTC <laughs> and didn't have to do air raid drills under the table like the, they would, I would have had to do. I did it in New Paul Central School. I would have had to do it in Poughkeepsie High School. You know, it was a bad war environment. It's a Cold War environment. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't tell you that I went to practice school earlier in my life. While my parents were still married, we lived in Poughkeepsie about four blocks from. Vassar College campus, and Vassar College had a pretty tight affiliation with a private school nearby, 
which served as their practice school for their child study department. It was a strong child study department, very strong. And so I went to the Poughkeepsie Day School, where my father got a tuition break for us because he served as the accountant for the school. Um, and I went, and my sister went there too. So we went to Poughkeepsie Day School through my fourth grade, then to Hollywood, not a practice school, but then to New York, practice school, then to New Paltz, practice school, and then to Oakwood School. So I had the benefit of three different, three different, the Poughkeepsie Day School, Columbia Teachers College. Oh, and New Paltz was a practice school, yeah. My ninth grade teacher was, had a PhD in education, and he'd just come back from a Fulbright in Yap, right, on the, on the Marshall Islands. And he was a sophisticated man, not the ordinary teacher at the rural country. <clears throat> he was also a professor of education at New Paltz State Teachers College, you understand, you know, so more of an academic you know, mm -hmm. kind of guy. I'm glad I rose into his class. <laughs> I would not have had quite so good a teacher in the earlier, less eighth grade. Yeah. yeah. And your sister followed the yeah. same? Mm -hmm. same pattern. And she also went to Oakwood subsequently. But when we can't return to Poughkeepsie, she returned to Poughkeepsie Day School, finished there, and then came to Oakwood. So that was felicitous, as much as having Blanche, my stepmother, in the house, who was a much better counselor, presence. Um, so I've covered a lot, but and you, it doesn't get us up to the current era. And your mother mentioned, you mentioned that your mother remarried, but that it was a short-lived marriage. Well, not too short, uh, three, four years, something like that, yeah, maybe five, I don't know. But we never got close to Harry, her husband. Um, fairly considered. A, a liberal Jew from Kingston, New York, who didn't know much about what his liberalism entailed. He would occasionally read a, a liberal magazine or something, um, identified they remotely as a Jew, but didn't care much about it. He was an English teacher. He liked English literature. He found solace, actually, in reading Esquire and Playboy magazine because they had good stories in them. You know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and when they got divorced, I had always gone to Oakwood, and I was already out of that house. Mm -hmm. Going, living, going to Oakwood, I would do the reverse commute on the weekends, go see my mother. And, and, um, and did she remain single and a school teacher? She was very fearful, anxious. I don't want to get into it at great length. Yeah. It's kind of tragic. She. It's not fair to diagnose her in retrospect, but she clearly had some variant of panic disorder. Mm -hmm. And she was frequently unable to function. She would just collapse, crying, going in the dark room, closing the door. Um, and I don't, I'm sure that was part of her marital disasters as well. Uh, she. Many people tried to get her into therapy. She, but in reality, I can say this as a sophisticated physician, there was little that therapy could do for that kind of condition. And this was before the SSRI drugs. I won't get into the details. Yeah. But as long, they, they might have helped her a great deal. Um, but they weren't available then. And she was very humiliated by having to see a psychiatrist and never followed through, and the psychiatrist basically said, I can't do anything for you. <clears throat> uh, so that's part of the tragedy of my mother's inadequacy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you've gotten me through high school. Yeah, uh, and how are you doing in terms of? I don't feel hungry yet, but I usually, I'm a voracious lunch eater, so I brought myself a lunch. Good, good. But I don't feel like it now, so let's, okay. let's keep going. Yeah. I want to mention, the high school experience, because there was many good things there. I met my, um, there were Quakers and Quaker wannabes there, I said in a good sense, people who weren't birthright Quakers, that means something to the Quakers, birthright. 
but who were drawn to the pacifism, to the uh, contemplative side of, of the Friends tradition, capital F, Friends. <clears throat> and I got a lot from them. They gave me room to think, safety. Um, one of the most charismatic was my high school English teacher, 10th grade English teacher. I never really expected to go far in literature, and that's a wise assessment. <laughs> but um, he wouldn't allow me to back out. <laughs> I mean, he basically had a lot of thoughtful, philosophical things to do, challenges. We were reading Catcher in the Rye in 10th grade, you know, the kids who's challenge and so forth. And uh, he had not long ago graduated from Harvard College and talked about his Harvard life and things and a lot about challenges from this famous professor and that professor. I'm interested, I was curious, and didn't know much about it. And the assistant principal, the principal of the school was a rigid old wine Quaker who wouldn't fit well into my worldview. <clears throat> but the assistant principal was a very dedicated, kind, thoughtful guy who I felt I could turn to when I had questions and wanted to. And he would probe, how are you doing on your issues of social justice? What, what's, what's on your mind? You know, in, in a nice way. And I was intrigued by that. And it was only in the early senior year that he, the assistant principal, said, have you ever heard of Harvard? Because <laughs> the idea, I, I was supposed to apply to college. I wasn't ready for this. You know. Anyway, I, I had no clue. I hadn't thought about it very much. My parents' experience was pretty constrained. He said, you might be a good Harvard candidate. You know, I said, well, that's right. Mr. Hannaford went to Harvard, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I talked to him about it. Mr. Hannaford said, it was pretty, pretty cool place. You might do well there. I didn't think about it anyway. So I made application to Harvard and a couple of other elite schools. And and you were pretty young, like because you had skipped yeah, a grade. Yeah, right, so I was a year younger than this. But I said, and I, I got in. It was a, a good thing. Um, but I want to tell you about Mr. Legg, the L-E-G-G, -G, the <clears throat> assistant principal. Interesting story because he has returned to my life many times in memory. Um, he would think like this, only he didn't think like this. He thought like this because he was missing two fingers. Uh, and there was all kinds of rumors of why he was missing two fingers. And he didn't want to talk about it very much. He said, I had, a, I had a, an accident, um, he said. We knew he was a, a Quaker, a serious Quaker. I have since found out what happened to Sam Legg's fingers. He was a conscientious objector in World War II. Um, serious, very conscientious man. Um, he understood the reason for World War II, but didn't want to carry a weapon, would not do it, and chose conscientious objective status. <clears throat> and he was offered the chance to work it out as a medical guinea pig at the University of Chicago, where the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis where they can find a dozen um, COs, conscientious objectors, to a uh, enclosed area underneath the stadium for the rest of the war. And they were subjected to starvation um, to see what would be the physiology, to study rigorously the physiology of starvation among healthy young men. spent two years there um, during World War II as a guinea pig for the U.S. Army. Um, and in the middle of that, he was, he was, much of it, he was on starvation. It was in episodes of documented starvation, physiological test, what's going on. And in one of those episodes, they would, they would, they recruited these guys saying, you'll be on a college campus, you'll meet girls. It's, it's a nice place to spend World War II. Um, they did meet girls occasionally, but uh, it was very limited circumstances. He was invited to Thanksgiving dinner, but told he wasn't allowed to eat, right? And uh, out in the snow in Minnesota, he won. He said, I, I don't feel good. I'm going to go out in the snow. And they said, what do you do? He said, I'll, I'll help. I'll, I'll chop wood, he said. <laughs> and he walked out in the snow with an axe, 
had a psychotic episode and chopped his fingers off. Um, terrible tragedy. Could be worse, but you know, the kind of guy that this was the kind of man who actually helped me frame my moral compass. This is in a book called *The Great Experiment*. You might want to look up the what a, a chronicle of parts of this era we're talking about. Mm -hmm. *The Great Experiment*. Uh, I have an electronic copy um, about the, the young men who subjected themselves to this. If you can't find it, I, mean, I'll get, I have the detail in my Kindle. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. um, but those people included people who became federal judges, people who became famous professors subsequently. These were a very high-powered group of thoughtful men um, who were in that cohort. Many of them had similar psychotic breaks during it. And then when they got fed again, they weren't psychotic anymore. <laughs> So, you know, the military was that to have what they wanted. Yeah, they, I had that kind of thought exercise to live through in high school, which I wouldn't have had at Poughkeepsie High School, probably, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Oh, some of the teachers were in immigrants escaping fascism, coming to a Quaker school. Delightful um, writers from Eastern Europe, from Germany, from musicians, you know, coming to, to, to finish out their remaining years having escaped fascism in, in pretty Hudson Valley. It's a pretty place. So, there, that, I just thought I'd summarize my high school experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the senior year, <clears throat> I wasn't in operetta, which served me very well. Um, I was actually every year in high school. We had did an operetta. That was fun. We did that. It was high end for high school performance. We learned more music. We learned a little choreography. We learned collaboration on the stage as a chorus. And, and by the senior year, I was star in uh, one of the male roles of uh, Patience, the Milgram Sullivan opera. But it got me actually into Harvard. Uh, I won the national. I was a national merit scholar finalist, but I didn't yet have a national merit scholarship. I was <clears throat> invited to an interview at Western Publishing Company, which you won't know the name, but it's actually a very large printing plant in Poughkeepsie, New York, like the third largest business in Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah, IBM, then a roller, a ball bearing company and then Western Publishing. And they published very little but Donald Duck comics, Dell comics, they published Mickey Mouse comics and ran out hundreds of thousands of copies, colored comic books. That, and this is not horror comics, this is comic books that, as they were in the 50s, mm -hmm. 40s. They are, who knew? They sponsored a merit, national merit scholarship for one bright student from Dutchess County, New York. And so I was invited to meet with the vice president of Western Publishing to be interviewed as a candidate for this. And I pondered, should I shave off my sideburns? Because I was playing Reginald Bunthorn in The Bird of Patience. And this was sideburns were not in. And at Oakwood, it wasn't normal, but they let us do it for the operetta, right? And this is like the mid to late 50s? 57, 50, would have been 59. I was going to graduate in 60, okay. 59. Right. So uh, I said, I'll leave them on. Let's just see what happens. I, I don't, I don't, I want to have the sideburns. It's part of the operetta. He said, how nice to meet you, Henry. He said, uh, what's with the sideburns? <laughs> and I said, well, I, uh, um, I'm going to be in a play. What kind of play? Well, it's not really a play. It's an operetta. Oh, what operetta? I said, Patience. Patience by Gilbert and Sullivan. I love that. Oh, that's just... <laughs> so I got the West, I got the Mickey Mouse scholarship. Uh, now all I have to do is get into Harvard. <laughs> and I did. They knew I was funded, and so I got to go to Harvard on the Mickey Mouse scholarship because of my 
sideburns, uh, and I got the attention of the vice president at, at Western Publishing. Won the. There were other bright students in Dutchess County, New York. I was among the top, but not probably not at the very top. You know, cool. I got it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing was that this was the same year of the beginning of the sit-in movement, and it was uh, March. In the February of 1960, the, the sit-ins began at Greensboro at AT&T. I was very aware of it. I was watching it in the newspapers. We didn't have a TV. We did not have a TV in my childhood. Um, but I was mindful, aware of it on the radio, read the newspapers, and talked it over with my friends at school, including some of the black students. And we proposed that, that we should charge money for the opera, their performance, which we didn't usually do, and send the proceeds to the NAACP for um, supporting the sit-in movement in the South. I was uh, 16 years old working on this. Um, and we all got agreement. We got agreement to the school administration. We would do that. We publicized it. In the community, that this is, we wanted people to come and hear our operetta, and we would donate the f funds to the sit in movement. And then, on our spring break, four of us integrated group two blacks, two whites, two men, two women got on the bus and took the bus to North Carolina to join the sit in movement um, as part as our spring break from the Quaker School. Um, and so, I became one of the two first white people on the sit in movement in, in Durham. They, we got assigned to the Kresge at the Cress, I guess it was, at Durham, North Carolina. My one time at Durham, North Carolina, was as a 16 year old um, sit, um, sit in participant. Actually, the, the blacks were sitting in. We were standing outside holding signs, supporting them. Uh, uh, so, that I could do at a Quaker school, you know, that could come to, uh, could not have, and I stayed in the black household in mm -hmm. Durham. Um, yeah, tell me about the logistics about, so you had heard through the media that this was happening, and, so I'd like and to proposed to your, your you classmates to, to do a yeah. fundraiser, but take me to the next piece of volunteering to to travel, to participate, and how you worked with, was it with, through the NAACP that? No, no. Um, I can't remember all the details, uh, but I remember that I, the two blacks who participated, with, one was a black from New York who's, who I think didn't have a place to go actually, or did, that wasn't especially interested in going home with his family, but he was aware of this, it was, it was important to him. And the other black lived in, Durham, um, but it was, his father was a black physician in Durham, not especially happy about what was going on, but was tolerant and agreed to let us to come to and stay in his house and participate. And I can't remember who served as our host group there. It wasn't him, but basically as soon as we got there, we were plugged in. Oh, you want to help? Great! I don't remember what the structure was because it wasn't part of the pre-existing structure in North Carolina. But we got there and they said, oh, sure, where would you like to go? I'm, will you sit in? Will you, well, you, why don't we put you in front? You know, sure. And then we went to rallies in, in fundamentalist, not fundamentalist, but in black churches. Oh, actually went to an integrated church in Durham, North Carolina. Small, with a kind of Charismatic, I don't mean theologically charismatic, mm -hmm. energetic white pastor who, who was so proud of having an integrated congregation in, in Durham. And I remember going to services, and we stayed four days, five days. It wasn't, it wasn't a big, big, big commitment, but did that. So that was nice. So that's, that high school environment permitted me to do that without being just dismissed. I would have been dismissed or worse if I tried to propose that at Poughkeepsie High School or New Falls High School. Nobody would have known what was going on. They wouldn't have understood it. But the Quakers knew. Um, 
One of, uh, one of my Quaker history teachers is not a, a spellbinding teacher. <laughs> he was fairly impaired, a rather old man, but he was, from, he was a, a North Carolina Quaker from central North Carolina. He, he knew what it was like, the white man. Uh, he supported us, he encouraged us, he referred us to people, oh, I can't remember whether that helped or not, I don't remember, but you know, he said, yes, I think you should do that. I mean, we need more people to speak up, you know. So, you know, had some support from those kind of people. Uh, and with this sort of emergent consciousness and activism, how does your family respond? My mother had very little to say. She basically was absent. I mean, oh, you're going to go to North Carolina? Oh, okay. That she didn't get it. It, it didn't, I, I don't think it, it computed for her. Mm -hmm. She didn't, she, I think, was just fearful. She was tuning out. It's interesting. I don't have any recollection of her even participating in my, or responding to my decision. And my father said, wow, this is the time. I guess you got to do it. Yeah. And he didn't oppose it. He didn't tell me to go. It just it was saying, you know, it was basically my doing. I worked it out. And Blanche? Likewise. I mean, she facilitated. I'm sure in some way they helped because probably needed some cash in my pocket. <laughs> um, and I'm sure they drove me to the bus station. They probably picked up the other kids from school who didn't have a car every all Friday, drove together to the bus station. Actually, it was a train. We, I think we took the train to New York and then got on the bus in New York City. You know, but, you know, they were, they were, I was not rebelling against my parents. Um, I might have been rebelling against my mother if she could articulate her fear, but she didn't. <laughs> um, my father, I, I don't even remember him admonishing me that this is dangerous. I hope you were, you know, thinking about it. But I felt like I was prepared. I don't remember exactly why. Possibly he was helping me think things through. Possibly some of the school faculty helped me think it through. You know, this, this is a good thing to do. Um, we're not unhappy that you're doing it. Think through the hazards that might be in front of you. Uh, we wish you well. Don't get killed. Mm -hmm. And the event itself? I was never think? threatened in that. Even as an integrated party on the interstate buses, it wasn't that bad. I mean, uh, getting as far as Philadelphia or maybe Washington, D.C., we didn't expect any trouble. We thought from south of Washington we might, but that was only, what, six hours? Or, it wasn't a big, I don't remember, but the remaining trip wasn't that long, um, and most of it was in the dark. <laughs> I don't think anybody was paying attention. Um, maybe we were too young to be a threat. I mean, and then when, during the actual action itself, was yeah. it multiple days that you? Yeah, not many. Yeah, uh, the whole trip might have been six or seven days. Mm -hmm. The actual picketing might have been only three. I don't remember. And do you recall whether any of the the patrons or passers-by or the no, I, I was owners never of the establishment? I was aware. I, I had gone through a bit of training there. Uh, like you know, we're trying to we're going to be nonviolent. You know, try not to get engaged in any violence or any responses. And I remember a couple of people came by and said, Ugh, "Oh what Shameful! Oh, don't let it. Why are you doing that? But that was the worst of it. Yeah. I was not threatened physically. Um, I felt proud of being there. It was good. Um, so that gets me to college, I guess. Uh, and, and before we start, and maybe as a, a transition into into your college years as well. You mentioned Mr. Legg, was it? Mm -hmm. um, and the vice principal? He was the vice principal. Oh, he was the vice principal. Yeah. He okay. was the vice principal. He, would, he, he was fluent in French, 
and occasionally was substituting for our French teacher when I, I, was, I had a French class for three years. Um, so I saw him around, and he would come to events. You know, he'd come to plays and stuff. And so was, he was not unknown. His office was always open. The door was open. You know, people could come in for counseling. I wasn't ever in need of counseling other than the conventional, are you filling out your application forms, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Were there other people in your personal life or sort of national figures that you look back now as that they were quite influential or models for you? Were there things that you were reading or seeing, different types of media that um, made, a, made a big well, impact on you? I fulfilled my reading obligations to the classes I was taking, and many of them were political, philosophical, compared to most traditional high schools. Mm -hmm. um, I um, was aware of Albert Einstein, who died while I lived at Columbia Teachers College. Uh, in my more recent life, I've read much more about Einstein, especially in my retirement, and I, I'm really stunned at what a brilliant guy he was, far beyond the math and physics, for which he's famous. <laughs> Um, but I was aware, of, you know, that he was socially important and yet suspect. Um, and I identify now that last year the new edition has come out on a book called The Einstein File, which is the massive FBI file that was kept by J. Edgar Hoover, specifically on Einstein, whom he detested. Um, and um, it confirms all my suspicions about the, to the toxic environment up through 1954 when Einstein died. It went beyond that, but um, <clears throat> the, the outrage of Einstein did everything wrong. He was Jewish, he was a socialist, and he identified in Princeton, New Jersey, not with Princeton, but with the black community. He lived in the black community in Princeton. Who knew? You know, and, and every day he'd take a walk through the black community and people would come and invite him in for lunch or whatever. And this is where Einstein lived. <laughs> and Paul Robeson, who was born in Princeton, had already vowed, I will never return to Princeton. It's worse than Birmingham. It is, it is a dreadful city based on privileged white boys coming to that goddamn university. And um, Einstein convinced him to come back and bring his struggles back in Einstein and Paul Rhodes and became close friends. And, uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So I was aware of Paul Rhodes. I was definitely aware of Paul Rhodes because he was among the people that I, with my father, identified as persecuted, which he was. I was aware of W. Du Bois being persecuted. I was aware of... And it, was that through your high school curriculum that you encountered Du Bois? Or? Yeah, and also through the left-wing magazine that my father would have in the house. So I was reading left-wing magazines. Yeah, was, which included... Oh, the National Guardian was a newspaper. Not the same as the Guardian from Manchester, England, mm -hmm. but, but a very progressive newspaper that refused to be anti-communist, but it actually wasn't communist. It was the eclectic left. Um, very informative. And aware of my Uncle Gordon, who in that period was paying the price of being a blacklisted screenwriter. He had split from New York, got a great job offer to go out to one of the big studios, I think with Warner Brothers in Los Angeles, became a film writer. He was, he was a sophisticated guy, and he wrote a dozen great B movies. <laughs> None of them, and he made a lot of money doing it. He was well paid in that era. And then came the Hollywood Ten. Uh, there was actually 19 people subpoenaed. The first ten actually got called to testify, and every one of them acted out 
so badly that they embarrassed the House Un-American Activities Committee and they just canceled the, the, the final nine never got called because it was, the whole thing was an embarrassment. The, the press got fascinated with all these famous screenwriters and actors. Did you ever see Trumbo? The movie? Yes. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good depiction. Yeah. And my uncle Gordon became a very close friend of Dalton Trumbo's. He was one of the 19. He was not actually... He was the big 10. He wasn't the first 10. He was in the next group. He flew, he was forced under subpoena to fly from Hollywood to Washington to be in a hotel room because of the subpoena requirement. He wasn't called, but his roommate in the hotel was called. His roommate was Bertolt Brecht. So Michael Gordon and Bertolt Brecht flew together from Hollywood. I don't know if you've read Brecht, Brecht's testimony before the House on American. It, mm -hmm. it is a long poem. It, <laughs> oh, it, it, it is incredible. My uncle's comment is, Bertolt, ah, he's kind of hard to live with and his, his socks smell. That's those are his biggest faults. Yeah, come, right. come now. <laughs> um, but I was aware of pers people being persecuted in that period. I recall my father liked Danny Kay. I didn't quite know why he liked. So with a few, we went to the movies occasionally and go see da Danny Kay movie. It was fun. Danny Kay's kind of happy-go-lucky singer in, in musicals and acting, but he was somebody who stood up against the House on American. Not in the Hollywood 10, but he, he was publicly critical of the, the witch hunts. And so it was okay liking my father. But we, uh, who else? We listened to the radio occasionally at night, uh, in the evening together, or at Sunday supper, we would, the radio might be on, and we didn't have a TV. I was, well, and I remember it was okay to listen to Tallulah Bankhead. I had no clue why. I thought it was peculiar. She was interesting. She, was, she talked funny, like those Southern girls. That, does that ring a bell with you? Yeah, I don't know. But I, I have only in recent years read Tallulah Bankhead came out against the House Un-American Activities Committee from a very privileged position. I only learned about that in drives through North Georgia. I said, why? Tallulah Gorge is a fascinating name. Makes me think of Tallulah Bankhead. I wonder if there's any connection there. There is a connection. The Bankhead family was a very strong right-wing reactionary family going back to the Confederacy. They included three or two governors of the state of Alabama. They, Alabama. they included senators of Alabama, Supreme Court justices of Alabama, Bankhead, 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 Bankhead Highway. Highway. Uh -huh. That's the same family. Bad. Bankhead family. The Somebody in that Bankhead, a Bankhead heir, took his bride for a honeymoon to Tallulah Gorge. That was a, actually an upper class resort back then. It would have been about the turn of the century. All right? And apparently she was conceived there. And a quirky family, I guess, um, they named their daughter Tallulah on the, on the presumption that that's where she was conceived. Isn't that fascinating? And she became, she became a renegade. She, she re rejected her privileged white background, became a New York City Bohemian writer, actress, um, raconteuse. Um, it's, it's interesting. That, you know, my father was not tolerant of the, much of the popular stuff on radio, much less TV, but we could listen to the little Bankhead show on the radio. <laughs> right now I know why, you know. Mm -hmm. She was okay. I, I never grasped her as a Southern role model for me. Because I, I only, it's only eight or nine years ago that I actually read about her origins. I mm -hmm. never figured that out before. Who else? I can't think of many more formative models in that era, but acquired many more later on in life, mainly my medical school mentors and stuff like that. Um, 
that's something I'd like to get to. Yeah, please. Um, or college. Mm -hmm. So I arrived in college and wanted to be something that was unclear, probably a mathematician or a physicist, because I had excelled. Oh, I left out one mentor uh, right at the transition period into college. As a credentialed uh, superior student, what a disgusting school, way they run the school system. As, a, as one of the si very successful math and science students in upstate New York, New York City was always reckoned separately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> upstate New York was its own competition group. Far inferior, I think. Um, but I don't want to go there. Um, so I, I was identified in my high school year, the middle of high school year, as a major up-and-coming math student from the state of New York. Some kind of foundation bothered, wasted its money on this kind of thing. So my prize was to spend a weekend in Albany, New York, in a hotel, learning what you can do as a mathematician, your career in mathematics. And the usual speakers were there, IBM, General Motors, Metropolitan Life Insurance, um, Bell Labs. They were all there, and I was rolling my eyes saying, oh, you're going to make a lot of money, you can live in a big house, you can work, have a beautiful laboratory to work in and all that kind of stuff. You know, this is really cool. Mind you, my school, the Quaker School, is across the street from IBM. IBM factory number two was in Poughkeepsie. And in that era, they, it was big, but it's not yet computers. It's just a small IBM research lab where we actually could see prototype computers being made. But none of us took that seriously. What the prototype computer could do then is as big as ten of these rooms and could only do multiplication. Anyway, that's off the point. But we went there. The one speaker at that event, this is why it's important, was a guy who said, I want to give you a different story. I only have a few minutes, but it's not all about making money, he said. Um, if you are good at mathematics, you could understand how the pattern works of money coming into an insurance fund and going out and serving the beneficiaries of the fund. That's what it should be about. So he said, that's what an actuary does. He said, I want you to be an actuary. Now you've heard from the Pfizer Metropolitan Life Insurance. They can do a good job of making a lot of profit from Metropolitan Life Insurance. But I'm the actuary for the New York State Employees Retirement System. And my job is to maximize the benefits for the retirees, who are your school teachers, the policemen, the firemen, the people who railroads. Tears are coming to my eyes because this is a different message. This was my my hero, Max Weinstein. So at the, at the break, I went to see him. I just said, I really liked what you said. He said, I could tell you were not, and you were you were getting it, you know. He meant a great deal to me. He was just a wonderful man. Um, and uh, he said, can I have your address? I'll, I'll, let me send you some information about how you could look more into being an actuary and doing this kind of work. And so, of course, I gave him my address and he sends some stuff. And basically, our short correspondence boiled down. I, I, if you, you and your parents agree, I, I'd like you to come and work for me for the summer after you graduate from high school, before you go to college. At that point, we didn't even know where I was going to college. But I'll give you a job and help you find a place to live. And, and uh, so I became his junior associate in the New York State Employees Retirement System. He was the actuary for the system in an office of four blocks from my little apartment that I shared with the event. He helped me find a place. A medical student at Albany Medical College had needed a roommate and, you know, it was great. This is archaic. I mean, every day I go and punch, 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 crunch. Before, no electronic computer. This was actuaries. And then you draw the total and then you multiply by 1.065. And, right, and then you write up a memo. 
you know, uh, here are the alternative investment strategies so that we preserve the corpus for the school teacher fund for the, da, 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 you know, and, and the yield would be this and so many weeks and the yield would be that and so this is what actuaries do at a very sophisticated level, uh, but without electronics. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a good time uh, being with Max and meeting his family, and um, his wife was a dynamite rabble rouser. She had founded the Planned Parenthood Federation of Albany County against great opposition from the Catholic Church, you know, and she was its defender, and uh, all kinds of, they were interesting liberal Jewish couple in Albany, New York, maximizing what a gem. It came out of an environment very similar to my family's, my father's. Immigrant kid living in the ghetto, working his way through night school, getting an advanced degree in actuarial science, and choosing to serve the people of the state of New York. You know? mm -hmm. um, he told me, you, you can do this. You can have independent thought. You can work in it. It was wonderful. I, I um, to this day, love Max Weinstein. Um, great. Important. So I get to college thinking I'd go into math, and Max said, take the actuarial exam. He said, you know, there's a series of exams, but you're ready for the first one. I said, yeah, but most people are college graduates, and I take the first one. He said, I think you could do it. Give it a try. So I took it as a college freshman, and I flunked. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, and I was, I was not, I didn't have time to prepare. It was a lot of stuff, but I, I wasn't, I was taking calculus in college then, first year, but wasn't any of that. He said, you know, enough. He was, it wasn't true. But I I think I'm over with actuarial science, but I still got a lot of philosophical support from Max Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Great man. Um, Did you stay in touch with him subsequently? Uh, for a few years, years, and then he died. The best recollection I have is after I was married and had my first child, we went to visit Mickey's um, mother and stepfather, who lived in Schoharie County, New York, which is about an hour's drive outside of Albany. And so, at my recollection, at my insistence, we drove in and I introduced Max to my wife and my baby, and it was lovely seeing him, and he died a year or two later. Mm -hmm. That's not all I could do. Um, but I was glad I had that chance, Yeah, because that was 10 years after I Eleven or twelve years, maybe after I uh, knew him, as a, just out of college, I just out of high school, mm -hmm. intern working for him in the actuarial science. Great. I can't say I was learned actuarial science. I learned philosophy and thinking and caring. Wonderful man. So I get to college thinking I'd go into math or physics. Not a bad thought. I, I was excited about it, and I, but I, in my transition through junior high school, I skipped, I skipped the traditional year for taking biology, which is usually freshman year in most of the New York State systems, but I was between the Quaker school and the skip to grade, and so I, I only took physics and chemistry in high school, never took biology. So I said, well, at Harvard you have to take a natural science introduction course. Whether you're a major or not, you have to take a social science course, you have to take a humanities course. Three general education requirements. I'll take gen ed, uh, uh, nat sci, natural science five, a brand new class being offered for the first time at Harvard for introductory biology. That would be my way to just catch up with what I missed while I was taking also physics and chemistry because I, or math rather, because I, I wanted to get ahead and start moving on that. But that was fine. I took, well, it turned out this was the very first undergraduate class in the planet on molecular biology, which was brand new then, right? So uh, James Watson uh, was there to give the lectures. Let me tell you what DNA is and how we know. And then George Wall, another Nobel laureate, and Matthew Messelson, another Nobel laureate, were saying, this, you are getting the first course 
in the biology of life at the molecular, molecular level. I expected I was going to learn about pistils and stamens and, and xylem and phloem and the bark growth on the tree. <laughs> we were into molecular biology. And the Thanksgiving vacation, I went home to Joe and Blanche, my father and stepmother, and said, I don't know how to explain this to you, but I really think I know what life is all about. I really understand it. And they were like, oh, no. I said, no, don't say that. Look, I'll just, it's, it's not the noise. Of it. I know it's hard to grasp, but the mo I, know, I now know how the molecules work that make life happen. You sure you want to stay at Harvard? This is crazy. Do, do not do this to us. You know, they they were stunned and a little bit hostile about that, mm -hmm. but not really. I mean, they were they were supportive. You're learning interesting stuff. We don't get. We don't understand this. So I basically got in on the molecular biology ground floor. There were no other undergraduates anywhere in the country who were getting that class. Um, and I put my got. I needed a job as a college student for helping to pay off my loans. So I, was, I was washing their glassware in their, their laboratories. And uh, they interpreted my presence as, this is one of our future grad students, you know. He, he's hanging in here. But I, then the Vietnam War got on my brain and the accelerating civil rights movement. Because you entered Harvard at age 17. In 1960. Uh, I entered in, in 60. Right? I graduated from high school in 60 and entered the fall of 60. Right. And, and I, with your transition into Harvard, what was that like socially for you? It was, I was prepared because I had been in a prep school environment. Not the worst of prep school, not the Exeters, <laughs> but I've been in the prison, and not, I, I knew there was a privileged class. You know, I wouldn't have seen them at New Paul State uh, Central School, but I found them there. Some of the kids in my Oakwood class had yachts and stuff. And, you know, they weren't necessarily Quakers, they just needed a place for their parents to spend money to send them to prep school, you know. But I was aware of it, and I knew that there'd be a dormitory environment. I knew what that was like because Oakwood was a dorm school, and on a few occasions when my father and Blanche would go on a vacation, Oakwood would allow me to stay in the dorm. They had a couple of flexible rooms if I could stay. And that worked. And I, I knew what college dorm, what college food was like, would be like from Oakwood cafeteria. Um, it wasn't a terrible shock. Um, it was not luxurious. Actually, in that era, Harvard students were supposed to be sparse, and they, they lived in, well, some of the ones did live in very luxurious housing, but most of us lived in dorms that were a little bit lean, <laughs> but they were ancient. You know, this, your building goes back to 1789, and this, you know, look at these famous people who lived here, and uh, mine was not that great. It was not luxurious in the middle of Harvard Yard, though. I mean, John Harvard's statue was right out my window right there. <laughs> um, and in fact, that was the same year in which, on my arrival, the, the election of John F. Kennedy happened in November of 1960. And John F. Kennedy made a triumphal return to Harvard, drove in an open convertible right through Harvard Yard, right outside my window. I had a ground floor window, open window. I could have touched his convertible coming by right outside. He was right there in front of me, John Kennedy, coming in to pay a net. You know, the return to Harvard before he's inaugurated in 61. Um, but then that's no big deal. I, I mean, I got used to it. A lot of exciting clubs, a lot of drama to go to. Um, I, pl I played in a jazz band. Um, playing what? Um, clarinet and sax. Um, most none of us are privileged kids. We were kind of middle of the middle rung academic high school kids who fooled around with jazz, but none of us is real good. I was not the best player. I played third sax in the band. And had you played yeah, for I years did. as a youth? In, in Poughkeepsie, while I was at Oakwood, I, I um, took clarinet lessons. Also, not at the school. Plant, but, 
the operettos were pretty cool, but the orchestral preparation was very poor at Oakwood. Um, but I had private clarinet lessons, and I played briefly with the Middleton Valley Philharmonic as the last clarinet, uh, because my teacher was the first clarinet, you know, and it gave me a chance. I was not very good. I expanded to play the sax a bit because it's similar, and I could mm -hmm. find a place in the jazz band for that. But I only did that through freshman year, then I didn't have time to stay active in music. <clears throat> How did I get to music? I did for some reason. Just talking about settling into Harvard, and oh, yeah, there were right. a lot of interesting clubs and groups. Well, and I, yeah, that um, we I was involved in basically the. They weren't called peace groups, but they were groups that were concerned about nuclear war, groups that were concerned about the war coming in Vietnam, and we were very aware of what was happening in Vietnam. Most of the students weren't, but the left-wing groups I gravitated to were very aware, and much of that East Asia, Southeast Asia science, uh, academia stuff was at Harvard. And all of, so we know that something bad is going on. This, the U.S. is building up a lot of resources there. There's going to be a major war. We are uh, supplanting the French. We knew the Dien Bien Phu had happened six years before, but it's now the U.S. government and the CIA is in there. We were, we were not just paranoid. We were well informed. Mm -hmm. We were active in those groups. Uh, to toxin, T-O-C-S-I-N, was the main peace group. It was ringing the alarm bell, the toxin, saying nuclear weaponry is going to destroy our species. Ding, ding, that group was called Toxin. And we were educating ourselves a lot. I wasn't talking about social clubs like Overplay Bridge and Tennis. And that's, there were guys doing that in our dorms, but not this guy. Um, and um, I knew there had been a socialist club at Harvard in the 30s. It was quite famous. It was called the John Reed Society, and named after John Reed, who was a Harvard alum. Um, I kept looking for it, <laughs> couldn't find it. Uh, so um, uh, by second or third year, we reconstituted the Harvard Radcliffe Socialist Club, and uh, that became a way to focus together left-wing students who were interested in socialist theory, Marxist thinking, um, and responding to the political outrages on the planet, is, um, and the blacklist. And so there was always a, a nucleus of a dozen people. We would, in my, in my class, at least, I don't know, at least five or six, maybe more, and more, probably a dozen just in my class. We would often sit together in the cafeteria and talk about our shared political backgrounds, many of them from New York City or uh, had public school educations in New York, but really high, very high level, Stuyvesant High School and Bronx High School of Science kind of people. That, that supported me a lot, and they became close friends. <clears throat> My roommates, I, I said to the dean's respond, I, I responded to the dean's letter on, on arrival, you know, uh, what are you looking for in a roommate? And we'll, we'll assign. So I just eager to meet someone who's different from me, from a different cultural or racial group, thinking conscientiously about race. And they didn't quite get it. <laughs> I mean, I wound up with a Chinese-American student uh, from Marblehead, Mass, who's a middle-class kid, nice, nice young man, mainly interested in meeting Chinese girls. Uh, that was his main interest. Um, and uh, we had three guys in the room. It was a two-room suite. The, three, the other guy was a very lonely, peculiar gay man. Well, I don't know if he was gay. We'll never know if he was gay, but he certainly had no interest in, in girls. <laughs> uh, and most of us did in that era. Um, very remote, aloof, clearly a good student, but didn't talk about much. I think he was probably quite repressed. I don't know anything about him. I read his obituary in Harvard alumni rags um, a couple of years ago, and surprised to see that he had a spouse um, who seemed to have a girl's name, but I don't know much more than that. Mm -hmm. He was, so neither he, um, no Bob Chu um, were my close friends, but I had no trouble having. I mean, we got along, but, but, but we didn't choose to stay together as a group. My uh, 
I chose as roommates guys who were clearly out of the, had left parents. Mm -hmm. One was a guy whose father was a famous economist in the F.D. Roosevelt's brain trust. Um, he was the left end of Wave Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, and the other was a guy whose father was an Episcopal priest in Brooklyn who ran a very seriously interracial congregation and was thrown out of the Episcopacy <clears throat> because they thought he was a communist. Um, and for all I know, he was. But that's the, that was the inner city interracial congregation on which West Side Story was based. The, the story, the author, Jerome Robbins, and it, they got their story from this particular church. And the son of that pastor was my roommate. Yeah. So we were three guys who had left pretensions. <clears throat> um, the Socialist Club drew us together. Mickey and I had a wonderful series of experiences starting Mickey, who is your wife, yeah, yeah, and yeah. who I have interviewed right. previously. Yeah. I'm sure this is compatible, whether she mentioned it or not, I don't know, but we, together, with about five or six other people, regularly attended a socialist discussion club. It was not the same as the Harvard Radcliffe Socialist Club, but it was just a kind of study group. Um, and it was conducted, we did it because one of our friends found that there was a community of European socialists of great renown, much older than us, who lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and had time on their hands. And they would love to talk to us. So the two best professors I had, the hell with James Watson or George Walter, these Nobel laureates, the two best professors I had during my college years were these guys off campus. They were retired professors. Um, one never had an act. Oh, excuse me. One was retired from Talladega, Alabama, but he was a German refugee, a secular Jewish refugee from fascism. Came to the States in 1939, escaped the price on his head, and chose to be a professor at Talladega University because he wanted to go help black people. He's a brilliant scholar, philosopher, a thinker named Fritz Pappenheim. The Alienation of Modern Man. It's a, it's a Marxist classic about what it underlies why people in modern industrial society feel alienated. Mm -hmm. you know, he would meet with us as often as we would come to his apartment. You know, Just a small, gentle man. His socks never matched. He would do this just classic. And he would spend the rest of his days in the Widener Library preparing another manuscript, an article, reading, 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 thinking. Um, and the other was a Dutchman, Dirk Struik, um, who was a very successful American academic. He was previously successful in Leiden, where he was a professor and a PhD graduate in mathematics and history of math. MIT hired him. He was a named professor of mathematics and history of mathematics. But he was a Marxist, and a very conscious Marxist. He wrote articles from a Marxist perspective on the history of science. How did he, what parts of society contribute to the development of mathematical thinking? How can you do, how does a society reach these ideas? Um, and he was a very renowned MIT professor until the Massachusetts Un-American Activities Committee nailed him and he was fired with a salary, because they couldn't take a salary away. They told him, you're not welcome on the campus. And he became an emeritus professor when, I don't know the details, I don't remember. But that was before us, uh, but he got, he was eventually reinstated. And the state of Massachusetts asked his apology, and he continued his career, continued to be an active writer, reviewer, lecturer, until his death. Age of 106, <laughs> which is only a few years ago, actually. Dirk Struik, a brilliant man and so kind. He looked like the proverbial Dutch uncle who would smoke a long meerschaum pipe. 
so what do you think of chapter two? You know, mm -hmm. like um, he, his demeanor, and like Fritz Papen, they were good friends of each other. They lived three, four miles apart. They saw each other socially, but not much. I mean, they were both getting old. But we would sit cross-legged on the floor in their respective. Struick had a nice big house. Pop and I had a small apartment. But they, whether we didn't know one week from the next, we lost a week, we might have been once a month. Well, we're going to Struick's this week. We're going over to Fritz Pop and I can't remember. OK, we'll go to, we're going to Pop and I That's right. You know, they were just wonderful men, um, each of them with a, a loving wife to take care of them. <clears throat> in Struick's last interview at uh, MIT, when he was 105 around and something like that, they, they said, so what? We know you're still working. Well, how, what, to what do you contribute here? Longevity and successful academic involvement. He said, the three M's. <laughs> it, it was um, matrimony, <laughs> mark, uh, matrimony, mathematics, and Marxism. That's that's <laughs> that. <laughs> um, he's my one link. I can put this on. On the record, I am only one degree removed from Vladimir Lenin. In his adolescence, Dirk Struik had become a member of the Amsterdam Socialist Club in the Netherlands. And he was very much the junior member of the club, but he was an active member. And they were having a big international meeting. They were hosting it in Amsterdam. And they said, he told the story go down and be there early in the morning before the sun comes up and you have to light the stove and warm up the room. This would have been 1905, something like that, right? Um, I can't, I don't remember. Some mm -hmm. before from the period, North European winter, go down and have the, the room warm for the people who are coming from all over Europe for this meeting. He goes down and he tries to get in and there's this body lying in the store in the entranceway, lying there. He says, excuse me. Oh, I said, that's all right. I, I, I didn't mean to block the way. What's, what it turned out, Lennon was lying there sleeping on the sidewalk. He had just come in on the train and he, he knew where he was supposed to go and Struwick was lighting the stove for the, so that they could have this international socialist meeting. <laughs> so there, I'm, that's my only uh, linkage to Lenin, but you know, <laughs> a fun story. Is it a nice yeah. story? Um, Struik is full of full of stories like that, mm -hmm. most of which would not be appreciated by those who haven't dabbled in the scholarly origins of Marxist thinking and philosophy. It's just incredible. So, those are my main. I had one freshman. <coughs> it's probably a, <coughs> a later year in college. One professor who was just a wonderful man because he cared about students, very different from many of the others. He didn't have his tenure because he had done world class Nobel Prize research. He didn't. But he was such a wonderful, warm teacher that, for some reason, Harvard violated its own tradition and gave him tenure anyway. I think he had tenure. I don't even know. But he was a full professor, and he really kept this. He taught Chem Two, which is chemistry course for people who are probably really going to be serious about chemistry, not just a, you know a, a intense chemistry at the early level. What we expect. So I took that class. I guess the next year. He was just great because he cared, and he would run up and down the stairway in the amphitheater, and he said, "You, George, so I have this uh, kinetic constant here, which is leaving me with numbers that are very small. What do I, you know, what, you know?" And he would motivate us to think the big thoughts, not just memorize formulas. So, you know, why is this important? Can you forget that number? Well, maybe you can. Maybe that number isn't important. If it's going to be vanishingly small, then let's. Go. So, where is the dynamic of this chemical reaction going? What's the big. Whatever. I don't remember the details, but among mm -hmm. the things he invested in me and my friend Mike Lewin, one of the left wing students I was close to, who was in the same class, same years, 
hey, you guys enjoy this and I enjoy engaging with you. I'm writing a book for introductory physical chemistry. Would you guys read the book for me and carefully? Yeah, I'll pay them. You know, in the veneer is not a big deal. But, you know, I want you to just think, th think it through. Does this make sense to you at the level that you're just leaving now, where you just were? Have I said it clearly? Would you change any of the words? And do the exercises. I want to see how the exercises work out. You know, it, the kind of guy who cared that much and made it fun to, to learn physical chemistry. I had always hoped to be a teacher like Leonard Nash was his name. He was a great guy, wonderful. Not a particular left winger or anything, just a uh, warm, clean, caring man. Um, uh, I don't know that he was ever famous for anything but that, but that's good, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, so, who else was important? I learned more, I'd say, from my peers than from any particular professor. There were a couple of professors that I detested, but I had to get through their class. I had to take organic chemistry. Oh, well, the, the big picture. I got so involved in social issues. I was doing a lot of protesting out on the streets and stuff. I said, if I have to live my life inside a laboratory depending on grants, I'm not going to be happy. I think I need to change my career course toward something that will use my scientific interests including molecular biology, maybe, and serve people on a daily basis. So I basically said, I'm headed, I think I'm going to be pre-med. And I evolved that way by the end of second year. Because it, the, the you had gone in sort of thinking maybe actuarial science, mathematics, something, and then... Yeah, I wasn't the serious biology. about actuarial science, <laughs> but math in general. Um, and I mean, I loved Mac Weinstein for his worldview, but... Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd be an actuary, but there was a lot of physics there, and that was fun. And maybe physical thought about biophysics, the physics of cell membranes, the physics of how DNA molecules untwist. You know, but that's pretty cool stuff. That might have been the area, but I moved in two years towards saying I need to be able to be useful with my science. I need to be able to help people, and medicine's the obvious place to go. Which point George Wald, who was my main laboratory <laughs> employer, <laughs> well, we don't need you anymore. You've gone over to the dark side. <laughs> you know, he said, uh, they're all quacks. You'll find out doctors are all quacks. You don't need, to, you need to stay in science. I said, well, I'd like to have different flexibility. And, well, okay, but um, we'll find other people to wash their hands to wear. Um, he said, you're going over to the quacks. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I did. I was a little unhappy with it. being rejected by him. He was a dynamic teacher and interesting man with a lot of, he took a lot of world views. Of, he leaded up Nobel committees for, for peace and stuff like that. And I give him credit, but he was a pompous and bombastic kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Not like Leonard Nash, who was down to earth, or, or Fritz Pappenheim, or Dirk Struhr, who were so kind. And, um, um, so, but I would greatly value the students more than anything else. No particular professors thereafter. <clears throat> In medical school, what saved my ass was the chance to build a small collective of medical students, a few from my Harvard Medical School class, <clears throat> but equally from Boston School, University School of Medicine down the street, Tufts University School of Medicine a little further away, these are other students who we found each other saying, we want to be socially involved in the struggles. We sat in with Tent City in downtown Boston, that's in that article I left for you. I, I reveled in telling recounting this to my classmates basically twice a week, as often as it was necessary. I would stand up at the end of a lecture and say, okay, I know, put away your notebooks, I want to tell you there's going to be a demonstration down at, you know, 
uh, South Station. We're going to defend the people being displaced from this new housing development. We're going to, we need to do this. And sometimes one or two of my medical student peers would come with me. And they often, though, would encounter me in the hallway and say, so explain this to me. What is it? Wow. Why are you spending so much time? Yeah, you're right. It is important. You know, I was doing that a lot in medical school. But the, the peer support I had, four or five students close to me from three different medical schools. And by the end of freshman year medical school, first year medical school, we'd acquired a, a following of a similar students across the country. We didn't have the internet. We did this by telephone calls and letters. Mm -hmm. And we founded in the spring of 65. It was the, no, the fall of 65. After one year of medical school, we identified enough of us that we said, let's have a national meeting. And we had it in Chicago in the fall of 65. <coughs> I entered med school in the, <coughs> in the fall of 64. In the fall of 65, <coughs> we had identified dozens of people across the country who were all, all medical students. <coughs> the ones who come to mind were all medical students, mostly men, as was the case in medical schools. There were some other students who were nursing students, and they must have been women, and social work students, but not very many. It was mainly a medical student movement. We called ourselves the Student Health Organizations, with an S on the end, <clears throat> and we said we would like to just stay in touch and meet and ponder how to make the medical system better. We were aware that Medicare had just passed. We were expecting within a few years it would cover everybody, not just people over 65. We're still waiting. It's a big part of my struggle now. Um, <clears throat> but we organized a um, um, joint meeting in the middle of the country, so to speak, Chicago, um, and we all flew there. I mean, I, I do have one or two more mentors to tell you about because they helped me get the money to fly to Chicago for a weekend. and. We invited Paul Dudley White to come speak for us. Paul Dudley White, another mentor of sorts, but not really, I didn't know him closely. Paul Dudley White was um, <clears throat> a grand old man at that point of American cardiology. Everybody knew his name in my era because he was tagged by the media as Dwight Eisenhower's cardiologist when Dwight Eisenhower had a heart attack during while in office. He had a heart attack while in office and he survived it. And Paul Dudley White, a famous cardiologist from Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard professor, was flown to Washington and saved him. Paul Dudley White would not say that. No, but he was the doctor associated with Eisenhower's recovery from a heart attack. <clears throat> the reality was, and Paul Dudley White was the first to say this, he, first of all, he healed himself. There was a hell of a lot of things that doctors did then for heart attacks that would heal them. <laughs> the, the science was, it was mostly wrong. <laughs> um, stay in bed forever. It was wrong, but uh, uh, Paul Dudley White knew that, but he knew the tide was against that. He, he conducted, he produced the first electrocardiogram in, the, in, the, uh, in uh, America probably 1928, 29, something like that, you know. He was a grand old man of cardiology who was renowned, more famous after he became Eisenhower's doctor because he rode his bicycle to work. He believed people needed to, to, <clears throat> to have exercise. I have a picture on my, in front of my desk of Paul Dudley White on his bicycle with a little white girl and a little black boy. He got it. He was making a point. Um, out on the street, uh, just encouraging them to come along with him. You know. um, so Paul Dudley White <coughs> came and spoke about caring for the patient and caring for the community, and um, not being too uh, 
contentious about your bills and your surgical ability that you have to think about the larger community. He was an interesting guy, very, and we were glad to have him. But the other students are all, many of them still among my closest friends. Uh, they were at USC, at, at Yale, at Chicago, uh, um, mainly from the elite medical schools and a bunch of other middle tier, solid medical schools, state schools, and we, we were very active all through that period leading to <coughs> this, um, the, the white coat clenched fist, because that's largely the story of the same group, of, of, of how we kept them, how we were individually disaffected in our various medical school environments, but didn't want to give up, wanted to do things, and <coughs> we stayed in touch, and um, it meant a lot to preserve our integrity mm -hmm. while in medical school. I did have another mentor in college. He was a Harvard Medical School faculty member who never made it to full professor, but he was prominent um, because he invented the defibrillator. He didn't make it to full professor because he was a Marxist. <clears throat> and he was on the Harvard faculty. And I heard about him through my step-uncle, Blanche's brother-in-law, who was the dentist in Poughkeepsie, New York, who, like Bernard Loud, my mentor, L-O-W-N, inventor of the defibrillator, everyone knows the name Loud, the defibrillator. <coughs> Loud and my uncle were among the handful of draftees in the Korean War who refused to sign the loyalty oath as a matter of principle. So even though Lown was already a famous cardiologist, he refused to sign a loyalty oath. got drafted, spent the Korean War peeling potatoes. Um, and my uncle, the dentist, did the same thing. And that's how they knew each other. Mm -hmm. So my uncle said, when you get to Harvard, I know you're not going to medical school, <laughs> but, <laughs> but call up Bern Lown, use my name, and invite yourself to dinner. You'll like him. He's an interesting guy. I did, and he is an interesting guy, and his wife is a lovely woman, and she was a social worker, similar concern and insights. They were lovely people, and they invited me to dinner, and Byrne said, stay late. I, I'm going to have a bunch of doctors come over, and we're forming a group called Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I think you'd like to meet them and see what you think. And they were the, that was, I have membership card number three of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I wasn't through medical school. I wasn't even in medical school yet, right? I said, I think I want, that gave me courage to say, I, I can do something in medical school and stay involved in social struggles and have some peers, have some peers. So Bern Lown, he gave me $25 to or my airfare to fly to Chicago to, to, for that meeting, you know. Whoa, $25. Mm -hmm. Um, you see, it's a Marxist conspiracy. <laughs> a very nice man. He introduced me to others, and many of them I stayed with. Uh, they were my mentors later on in medical school, and even though few of them actually taught my courses, one or two did, but most of them didn't, I could, I could know what I could call them and say, how would you handle this? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. well, well, what? Even if they were in another medical school, you know, right. that sort of thing. Nice to know they were all their peers. So Bernard Lowndes is definitely one of them. Jack Geiger was another whom I met there. He's still alive. Bernard Lowndes is still alive, pushing 100 years old. Um, and they're both still very active in progressive sides of medical care, but, but failing. I mean, they're frail. They're very frail now. Paul W. White is very dead. <clears throat> but the truth about Eisenhower's heart attack, I know because Bernard Lowndes' mentor was Sam Levine. Bernard Lowndes is Jewish and Sam Levine is Jewish, and they, neither one of them is a serious observant Jew. But, but they were on the outs in the Harvard search. Sam Levine was the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital's star cardiologist. When, uh, those who knew, they knew Sam Levine is the guy you go to, even though he's not a professor. He's, and he was Lowndes' mentor and so forth. But, when Eisenhower had his heart attack, the mil there were only a small number of military cardiologists at Bethesda Naval Hospital. <clears throat> they 
all knew that Sam Levine is the guy to call. And Sam Levine came down to be with Eisenhower because the army cardiologist said, Sam Levine is, is the guy, okay? And when he arrived in Washington, he went to Eisenhower's bedside and they took him aside and said, we really need your help, but this is, public relations will not allow you to be his cardiologist. And he said, well, my friend, Paul Dudley White will come down. He, he'll, he'll cover for me. He, he understands what's going on. We're close friends. He will do it. <laughs> and so Paul Dudley White is the public relations cardiologist mm. for Dwight David Eisenhower. But Sam Levine was really, I mean, they didn't have any disagreements. They, they, they knew basically how to take what little you could do for a heart attack case. And we can do much more now. I know that. Um, I'm, I am way ahead of where Sam Levine was in 1950. But uh, that's irrelevant. Um, mentors. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't. I didn't actually know Sam Levine. I met him once because Bern Brown introduced me to him in the hallway. But that's it. I, and <clears throat> um, those are interesting mentors. I'm happy to share that with you. Yeah. So it leads me to one more. In medical school, I did have a mentor who wasn't at Harvard. He was at Northwestern University, but he really wasn't that much of an academic. He was basically, <clears throat> he was a, a more in the nature of a um, independent scholar, physician. I, in medical school and third year, you get serious about taking the clerkships. You go through the rotations of difference. You know, my first rotation was pediatrics. I thought it, it was sort of a random pick. It wasn't up to me. The dean decides who go and where. But I knew that I had filed some preferences, and that was reasonable for me because I thought pediatrics had had a lot of prevention, and then I get to work in the community, get to know young families that would be politically concerned and active. I could help them. <clears throat> and my pediatric assignment was at the Massachusetts General, which had a small pediatric service, and it was ingrown and bitter and nasty and hierarchical to the worst degree. There were some exceptions, but basically at the level of which students worked, people were just pushing us around, telling us what to do, don't do that, don't tell this mother, don't answer that mother's question, go get another diaper, you know, that kind of stuff. It was mean and nasty and no one was having a good time. And I didn't feel like the patients were getting a lot of good care, but I didn't know. I was beginning my clinical rotations. And so I called up Bern Lyle and talked to him for a while. I said, I'm, uh, he's not a pediatrician. He was a busy cardiologist and researcher, but <clears throat> I said, I, I'd like to talk to you because I think I'm going to might quit medical school. This is not the environment I expected. He said, let's talk about it. He said, would you be interested in doing preventive medicine? I said, yeah, that would be interesting. But I would like to take care of people, too. He said, well, I can't change how coarse it is on the inside and how bad doctors behave. <laughs> Maybe you can't, you know, um, but that's, but at the moment, I'd like you to meet my friend, Jerry Stamler. He will give you ideas that you've never believed were possible of what you can do in medicine, in prevention. Jeremiah Stamler. I said, how do I meet this guy? He said, well, he happens to be at the Mass General now, and I know you're at the Mass General, so when you get a break, go up to his room in the ninth floor in the Phillips Tower, the private tower. <clears throat> He's recuperating from surgery. He's, he's flown here from Chicago, where he lives. He's had a hip replacement, which in that period was a big deal, very unusual. But he was already famous because of his book, Preventive Cardiology. <clears throat> um, go up and introduce yourself to him. I think he'd like to talk to you, and he's got time on his hands. Okay? So here I was, a disaffected pediatric flunky seeing the seamy side of medical care in the competitive, backbiting, hate your patient kind of thing. 
it isn't always that bad, but this was. Mm -hmm. And um, so I knock on the door. I think we're 905 in the Phillips Tower. I'm making it up. It's something like that. And I hear, come in. I open the door. And there's Paul Dudley White sitting at the foot of Jeremiah Stamler's bed. Jeremiah Stamler's attraction. Like this. And Paul Dudley White is sitting at the foot of his bedside with a notepad. And they're having an intense conversation. <laughs> and whoa, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, come in, young man. Come in, come in. Don't bother me. It's not a problem. Come in. We'd like to. And uh, I said, Dr. Stamler, I'm, I'm here because uh, Dr. Lowndes and me. Yes, uh, Byrne told me about it. I, I'd love to talk to you. Stick around. I'll be finished with Dr. Um, um, White in, in a few moments. Um, and White had other things to do. He's a busy man, too. You know, he said, well, thanks, Jerry. Um, I, it was good talking to you. I'll be back tomorrow. You know, we have a great day. He walks out. <clears throat> Paul W. White, a little clinical cardiologist, he gets it about prevention. And, he, and Stamler had really built the field of epidemiology of heart disease. Why do some people get it and some people don't? What does diet have to do with it? He's the founder of the cholesterol hypothesis. And he's renowned in many ways for his extraordinary work in that field. <clears throat> um, I never heard of him. They never exposed me to that kind of stuff at the medical school. They didn't talk about that. Who would care? Why is that important? Well, I got it. And Stamler wanted to talk about epidemiology. You can look at big numbers and get the data and see the patterns of what's happening. Well, it's sort of like actual science, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't make the connection then, but I do it. I see it now. It's not unrelated and it's very appealing, except that you didn't take care of patients. You took care of statistical files and databases and numbers. And, but Stamler is a developer of chronic disease epidemiology up until people like him, which is basically in our lifetime. Only mine, anyway. I don't know how old you are, but you're almost as gray as I am. You know, yeah, right. 42. Um, yeah, well, I'm uh, 30 years more beyond that. Um, epidemiology was basically tracing communicable diseases, microbial diseases, smallpox, polio. Important, very important. And you can see epidemic epidemics breaking out upon the people, epidemics. Um, but the tuberculosis, strep throat, these were things that we could ascribe to microbial causes and were probably contagious and worth studying how they travel through the community. How do you do that? How do you find, how do you, without, since you weren't there and you didn't see the germ pass from this mouth to that finger to that mouth to that, how do you prove that? And you prove it by association. You show that this group of people was here, this group of people was there, this group of people got sick, this person actually traveled here this person didn't travel here. This person ate the potato salad. This person, you know, you, you put that together. I said, that's cool. Um, and, but he brought that into chronic diseases where you don't have a contagious agent. You don't have a microbe. Who is eating more bacon? Who is eating more vegetables? Who is breathing contaminated air? Meaning not contaminated with tuberculosis, but contaminated with fine smoke particles um, and so forth. So anyway, it was great to have lunch with Jeremiah Stamler almost every day of the week. And it was, I suddenly thought medical school was great. <laughs> I had somebody to talk to and he walked me through what you could do and make epidemiology of chronic diseases what you're going to do, which was novel. Paul Dudley White got it. Jerry Seimler knew how to teach it, and um, so I, then when I had electives time in the end of medical school, I took a class in epidemiology, um, and that's what prepared me to come to the CDC, mm -hmm. which does that. Even though at that point CDC didn't do chronic disease epidemiology, we just do microbes. CDC stands for Communicable Disease Center not the Center for Disease Control, it was Communicable Disease Center, the, the doormat, the over the wall, that's what it said. Okay. Um, 
they kept the name, the initials, the acronym. <clears throat> but in any case, I, I loved my epidemiology elective, did well in it. Um, the epidemiology teacher was a nice guy, not a close friend or anything, but certainly competent, good teacher. He appreciated that I got it, and, what, and he had been in the epidemic intelligence service in his earlier career at Atlanta. <clears throat> and he said, I hope you'll apply for the CDC because you'd be good at it and you'll have a good time. You meet doctors like you, but you can't do clinical care much when you're there. As I know, but, and that's when it clicked to me that, that I had refused to sign up for the military deferment plan for doctors, which is, we'll bring you in as a high paid officer with no hazard to your health if you will just pledge to become after so many years of residency, become a military doctor. And that's what virtually all my male classmates did that. And I had refused to do it. I'm not one of the groups I got involved with. I was one of the co-founders in medical school. Part of my reach out group across the country is called the Medical Resistance Union. We had over 100 doctors who pledged in public that we would not serve the military in Vietnam. We were willing to go to Vietnam and take care of civilians. But we not serve the military in Vietnam. Um, medical resistance union is what we call ourselves. Um, why am I going there? Oh, because of my CDC. They may have in my file that I was active in the medical resistance union, but the, the beauty of liking epidemiology, doing well in it, getting to go to be an intern at Boston City Hospital where I serve the poor, only the poor, right? Um, um, and doing that for two years and then going into the CDC, which was the expectation you do, two years of clinical practice, two, inter, residency, two years of residency, come work with us for two years in a research environment, then go back and finish your residency and become a practicing physician out in the community who understands epidemiology so we can call on you when there's an epidemic outbreak. That's the strategy. And they called it the Epidemic Intelligence Service to get it passed through Congress because it was established during the Cold War and there was no money for public health novelty. But they called it, well, we'll, we'll look for my, uh, germ warfare. We'll be prepared to look for germ warfare. Some of the people in the Epidemic Intelligence Service actually were developing germ warfare, but that's not public knowledge. They were what? Developing, preparing oh. for germ mm -hmm. warfare, and on the active side of that, not just the defensive side mm -hmm. of it. But I don't have enough hard evidence to fill you in on it, but I have some evidence off the point. Yes. I didn't hang out with that crowd. So I said, it's perfect. I'll do my residency and I won't have to go to Canada. I won't have to get, run away. I can get into the CDC, which is a uniform service. I call it the uninformed service, but it's a uniform service. Um, and we get a commission and it's, uh, it's a draft equivalent. And I came down in my senior year at medical school to have an interview with the CDC and it was golden. They loved me, I loved them. We talked about different projects I could do and how exciting it is that you still want to go back into clinical care and that's just a wonderful two-year interlude, get some research done. If you want to do academic, you can do that too. Um, and let us know by, in writing when you get back to home that you want, that you will accept our commission and we'll do the paperwork for you immediately and you'll have a draft from it. So I did that. <clears throat> that was before I graduated from medical school in the early part of very early 68. And um, like, they said, thank you, we've got your paperwork, we're sending it in to the Commission Personnel Operations Division. It never came, no, the Commission never showed up. It didn't show up. They said, we don't know what's going on. But, but, this, but I already I knew something about epidemiology. They liked that. They liked that I had taken the Harvard Medical School elective with David Postkanzer, one of their alumni from the Epidemic Intelligence Service who'd gone back to the Mass General in academic medicine. That was just what they wanted. They knew that how post cancer liked me, that I had done well. I, and they said, you're in. You know, we've, we've selected you, that's for sure. It never came. 
so the connection was I was disaffected with the hard ass pediatrics practices at the Mass General. Bernard Lown introduced me to Jeremiah Stamler, who by happenstance was recuperating from hip surgery. Uh, it wasn't an overnight surgery as it is mm -hmm. today. This is, you're on your back in traction for weeks, <laughs> practically not weeks, but enough weeks to be around. Um, and then the, the, uh, his telling me, do chronic disease epidemiology. We're gonna figure out heart disease and maybe cancer. This is cool. Okay, I got it, this is cool. But I couldn't get into the CDC because the papers didn't arrive until my legal case. So I arrived at CDC two years late because of the court case and would have been, I received draft, notice in the, draft notices in the interim, <clears throat> but my lawyers were KG. They have to be, that's their job. They had named as co-defendants the Secretary of the Army and the Selective Service System so that in case I was drafted, they would have to defer me mm -hmm. while I'm in court, and they did. Before we get to this interesting case that you gave a preview of before we, we started the recording, I wanted to go back. You had mentioned that in your undergraduate years that you were doing a lot of activism and protest. What issues and organizations, issues was that around and if it was through organizations, what were some I, of those? I was, I, yeah, there were organizations to which we responded, but these were students who were just were aware of the racial injustice issues. Mm -hmm. So if, if we read in the paper or heard on the phone that there was gonna be a, NAACP protest here or there, we would go to it, or something like that. And even more so about the looming illicit war in Southeast Asia. Um, and were the protests pretty local to yeah. well to Boston, or oh, were yes. you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe sometimes just local to the Harvard campus. Okay. Yeah. Um, not. I'm often going down to Boston Common. That must be where they got that picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, common, a common place for protests. <coughs> um, that best I can remember. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Much of that started before the Socialist Club. The Socialist Club appealed to me as an idea because we felt, I felt, we were doing much of this without a global view of why these, these little protests seem like the right thing to do, but what's the bigger, where's the arc of this movement going? Is, do, who are our, where are our, our alliances? We're not doing this out of traditional religion, some people were. Um, we're not doing this out of career advancement, some people were. <laughs> What's a worldview that fits for this? But that didn't occupy a hell of a lot of our time. It was wonderful to sit with Poppenheim or Struick and think about these things based on philosophical texts that were some of them 100 years old. Um, but that wasn't the main thing. I mean, a lot of it was ad hoc. We'd hear about a demonstration, call a few friends, say, doesn't that sound like it needs more people? Yeah, it sounds like it needs more people. Let's go. I would criticize that as uh, pointless and meandering, but I think it's not fair to do that. It, we did it because we were motivated by palpable injustice and, and cruelty and, and um, things that required a response. Were there any media organs at that time that would be publicizing these issues or upcoming responses or posters on bulletin boards. Okay. Yeah. I can't remember. I mean, I'd read about it. It was only after the fact and a few left wing newspapers and stuff, but they, they would help frame what we should be thinking next maybe, but we would be responding to crises. I don't mean to say that's all I did in college years. I was a serious student. I Clearly. Got, I, Clearly. I got the dean's list every, just about every year, and I made Phi Beta Kappa at the end of it, you know. Bullshit. 
but because my grade average was high. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's good for really, but I mean, I, I was a serious student. But um, I would have felt bad if I didn't respond to some of these things. Like, so I went to Mississippi Freedom Summer. That was <clears throat> when I got into Harvard Medical School, but still had a summer to wait until I started. I thought I'd like to live in New York. Nikki and I had been living together as an illicit couple um, during college. She was a part of this world. She helped organize the Harvard Education Socialist Club. I was its first president. I think she followed me as its next president. Um, she thought she might want to go to medical school. And how many students do you think roughly were involved in the Socialist Club? It wasn't hundreds. It was far less than that. Yeah, but uh, an active list, a maybe dozen. a dozen. Yeah, right. But we would put up posters, and we often would have meetings of interesting topics. What's going on in um, the African liber South African liberation? We were ahead of that. We were thinking about that, you know. Um, so thirty people would come, and five of them would be black. We'd never seen them before. That wasn't, you know, that kind of stuff. But you know, maybe a dozen. Um, why was I going there? Um, you mentioned going to Mississippi for oh, yeah. summer. So, Mickey and I decided that we weren't mature enough to marry. We were living together in an apartment, thanks to a couple of quirks in the Harvard housing rules and the fact that they misjudged and didn't have enough dorm rooms for everybody they accepted. They were eager to have seniors willing to move out. I can deal with that. I'll do that. <laughs> I'm sure we both thought this would, might lead to marriage. We were happy together, but then we weren't. We were actually itchy, uncomfortable in a bunch of ways, and we agreed mutually that we were going to break up and uh, not get married. And um, I said, well, this is my free summer before medical school. I'll go to New York. I have family history there. I have people. I know some friends there. I know I'm going to be in Boston for the next four years, so I'd like to have a chance. I had some fantasies. I said, I'll get a job. I'd like to work in the New York City subway and just be a motorman for the summer. And with, oh, I, never, I didn't follow that very seriously, but you know, the fantasy. I, I, didn't, I wanted not to tread on and depend upon my academic credentials. Do something else. I actually took out my Siemens papers. I thought, maybe I'll go to sea for the summer. I have the Siemens papers. I've never used them, but I, I thought I would just, I got scared. I said, shit, I'm a white boy. I'm going to wind up in a sleazy dock in Malaysia somewhere, and I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get a venereal disease. I don't have no clue what's going on. I, I don't think I'm ready for <laughs> so I, I, I didn't go to sea. I'm afraid I'd be seasick also. Mm. But I had no knowledge, yeah. you know. A skinny white boy. So I didn't do that. Um, so I'll go to New York. And then I saw a sign for a, a summer job at Cornell Medical School that needs a, a prominent neurologist needed somebody to work in his lab just for the summer. He's setting up a new summer and he thought anybody who's got some college experience and would like to come to you. So I took it, I said, no, I'll do this. I'll go work for neurologist Fred Plum. Think about neurophysics, think about neurology. It's practice, it's, it's intellectually stimulating, it's uh, complex, I've got some laboratory time, and I had a chance to live in New York and meet some new people, and I did. And I, my job was basically, I, I had got an apartment with a friend. He already was a grad student. Columbia, and he had a room in his apartment. I joined him. I took the bus to work or the subway, or occasionally hitched a ride with a physician I knew who lived near us and worked at the same hospital, so I didn't get a ride. And, and my job is we come in early in the morning and prepare cats for torture. <laughs> we were putting electrodes in the cat brains, and uh, his postdoc fellow was running electrical experiments. I barely knew what he was doing, but I knew roughly. I mean, and I knew my job was to shave this, remove this bone, uh, sterilize this long pipette, put it in this gyrus of the 
cat's brain, <laughs> you know, uh, that kind of stuff. It was sort of interesting, and I went to some seminars and um, tried to understand what they were talking about. I got a lot. I mean, I wasn't stupid, but I didn't particularly think this was my career, but I was prepared to hold out. And that was the summer when Mississippi Freedom Fighters started the Freedom Struggle. I was aware it was happening. Some I knew some people who were in it. I was admiring, admir admiring what they were doing. <clears throat> and then uh, Cheney, Schwinger, and Goodman were killed. I identified with them. Not that I knew them. Uh, ironically, Cheney was a local black, and Goodman and Schwerner were college students from Jewish families. That didn't mean a lot to me, but it could have been me. I could have been one of these guys going down early, you know, and I had thought about that, but didn't go that far to sign up. And then when that happened, I said, I think I need to go. And I found through the grapevine of left friends in New York at that time that someone was pulling together a medical committee for human rights. They would send doctors to Mississippi to support the civil rights workers in this dreadful, scary period without medical help. They didn't have any medical help. There was no doctors caring for Cheney and Schwerner and Goodman. <coughs> <coughs> So I got in touch with them, and I said, I'm not a doctor. I am just finished my permit. I'm about to enter Harvard Medical School. <coughs> Is there some way I can help? And this was already early August. Let's think about it. We'll work on it. And they decided they would recruit me to become basically the factotum, the, the driver, the chauffeur, the equipment hauler, the scribe for these doctors that they were going to recruit, none of whom would go for more than a week, but, but I could go maybe for more, so I went two weeks, you know, I basically, uh, it's all, it was at the end of the summer, and I said to Professor Plum, the neurologist, we've talked about what's going on in, Missis in Mississippi, I know, you, you know that I know about it, he said, yes, I am aware, you're thinking about it, we've, you know, we've mentioned it, and it's interesting, it's, it seemed like a very crucial activity. I said, well, I think I want to quit my job early and just go. He said, okay, I can't stand in your way. I'd like you to stay the whole summer, but it's not going to be a dentist. It's not going to be a terrible loss to my program. You know, we can find somebody else to torture the kids for the next a couple week. of weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you have my permission to back out. And I, it wasn't going to be a career breaker for me. I didn't expect I was going to spend my rest of my life putting pipe bed electrodes into cats. Um, so I did. And I flew there, um, kind of scared, <laughs> but um, met some wonderful physicians who were confident and calm. And uh, we got to Holly Springs. We, our assignment was that particular town in north central Mississippi. Not far from Memphis, but we flew to Jackson because we all had to go through preliminary training in Jackson for a day and then go out to our respective locations. <clears throat> and I had nobody, it was a brand new role. It was a brand new role for the doctors, but even more new for me because I, I knew I wasn't a doctor, but we found things for me to do. I mean, I did some driving, I did some setups of equipment, uh, and I also got a job of saying, find out what the public health nurses do. That would be interesting. We, we know there's a bunch of black public health nurses who are constantly out in the field. They seem to be paid by the state or the county. We don't quite understand it. What do they do? How, do, how much contact do they really have with people? Do, you know, I did. I got to I met granny midwives who were delivering, you know, eight babies a month there or whatever, and who knew all the pregnant patients in Fayette County. And, Lafayette County, and that kind of stuff. It was really uh, fascinating. And then I would do some testing. I would go to local physicians, all of whom were white, and say, "Can I? I'm a pre-med student about to start Harvard Medical School. Can I come talk to you?" <laughs> and I would go into the pads. Tell me how your practice works. 
Do you, how many patients do you see a day? Then? Are any of them black? You know, um, it was really fascinating. I, I really brought up some interesting reports um, about what they did, and they, they showed me. No, the blacks come in this door. They, that's it. That's it. I take care of them. Oh, but they come in this door. It's sort of at the end of the day, you know. They, and, and I was able to do some documentation, which went upstream. We, we sent this stuff around. It wasn't the same as voting rights, but it's civil survival. Mm -hmm. um, and I got chased out of town by the sheriff in a car race. It was pretty scary. He won, pulled us over. But um, the, I got to experience the flavor. <clears throat> the guy who was head of uh, the Holly Springs movement, it was then called CUFO, the Congress of Federated Organizations. It put together NAACP, CORE, SNCC, they, um, the CUFO leader there was Cleveland Sellers, who was a year younger than me, a very attractive black guy, um, a nice afro, who really listened to people, um, calmed us down, made sure we didn't do anything rash, and I was basically working under his discipline as much as under the MCHR met discipline, <clears throat> which was good, good experience. Um, on the way out, when my time was up, I was dismissed from Holly Springs and hugged everybody goodbye. And with Robert Thompson, the psychiatrist, who was a senior, an older man, physician from Canada, who was with me, he and I had a car to drive together back to Jackson so that we could leave to go to home at the end of the next morning. Jackson was our departure point. Memphis was closer, but we had a debrief at COFO. <clears throat> and when we had our check-in at COFO, we had a nice chat. There wasn't anything crucial. We had not had any violence. We suffered. They, didn't, they wanted to make sure how the documents said. We went to this hotel in the low-end motel in a small part of Jackson. And we checked in, and he was an elegant, white-haired Canadian psychiatrist, and the uh, black-haired, not bearded, mustached, gentle, trim mustache, free med student, basically. Um, we in a hotel room, and within two or three minutes, the phone rings. Hello, uh, you goddamn Jew mother, motherfucking uh, nigger lovers, you get the hell out of our city. Get out of our state, or you're not going to see the daylight. Right? Click. And this is in Jackson, like you had just arrived. Yeah, we we just got checked into the hotel minutes before. I get to the hotel room, and that was when we got. What did I do? Well, Kofu has Kofu has his protocol. Call COFO first, but they're going to tell us to call the FBI and to call the Justice the Department of Justice, basically. And to, well, so we called COFO. They said, "Yeah, go do the do the drill. Call the FBI. Call the Jackson Police Department. You've got to get this on the record." <clears throat> and they came, and both of them, the, the Jackson Police Department said, "Oh, they're just good old boys having a good time. They just tease it. Don't don't worry about it. But you can weaponize the lamps and stuff." You might want to push the bureau against the door when you go to sleep, you know, and that kind of stuff. They said, but, you know, call us if there's any problem. <laughs> and the FBI sort of said, so why are you here again? What, what were you doing? You know, and they took lots of notes. And I told them a straight story. I'm going back to Boston. I'm on my way from Holly Springs. I was part of hanging out in the civil rights movement there, helping people, making interviews. Uh, checking on people's basic health needs, although I'm not a physician, Dr. Thompson's a physician. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> um, they took a lot of notes and said, well, thank you for the information. We'll, we'll, you're on file now. Okay. <laughs> um, and that was it. So we pushed the bureaus against the doors and we weaponized the lamps, pulled the lamps out of it. We turned the floor lamps. We could 
making it battering around. We had no weapons. We're not gonna. We're gonna be basically nonviolent. But if someone comes in swinging, we could hit him with a lamp. <laughs> and this is their advice. Yeah, that's what, that was the policeman's advice. Um, <laughs> but don't worry about it. They're, they're not gonna bother you. <laughs> Nobody did bother us when we got on the plane and the airplane. Actually, the airplane had a catastrophe. It almost happened, and I might have died in that airplane. The windshield cracked at 33,000 feet, and we suddenly, the pilot depressurized the plane and brought us down to 5,000 feet over the Smoky Mountains in a hurry, and it was very scary. And then we finished the flight flying at 100 miles an hour, the minimum, what, 120 minimum speed so we wouldn't crash the rest of the windshield because it was cracked. We had to depressurize the plane, and we got to Newark, New Jersey, very late, <laughs> uh, because they throttled way back. You know, we thought we were going to die. That yeah. was totally unrelated. I'm, I'm sure. looking shocked because they didn't land at the closest airport. Like. Well, uh, I can't tell you why that is, but that's what they did. Uh, you know, they said, it looks like it's going to be stable as long as we don't provoke this glass anymore. <laughs> Delta, that was Delta. Then, you said that you had been chased out of town, like in, oh yeah, in, 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 in while in the car chase. Yeah, um, we noticed that we were being followed by the sheriff, and I there was a guy who was the driver for the team, and he was a show off. And he said, I, I can operate that guy. No, Jack, don't, don't. So he said, see, he's speeding up, and see, he's getting closer. Look in the mirror. See, I'm gonna I go for it. Jack, don't. He said, I'm going to do it. And he got out on an open highway and started running down the And the cop was coming closer and closer. He said, Jack, stop. Don't, Jack, we're not going to have a high speed crash. We're just going to stop and make believe we didn't know he was chasing us. And we'll see what he says. And he, he pulled us over and said, Well, who are you boys? What, why are you here? What are you doing here? Oh, you're doing to no good. We know what, you know. And he said, And don't come back. He said, You yeah. know, well, we went back. In Jackson, though. No, that that was in that was in Holly Springs. Springs. Okay, on the outskirts of Holly Springs. Um, Jackson was relatively safe compared to Holly Springs. Mm -hmm. So I see you looking out of there. I see it's getting to be too. I was just I saw that. I'm getting, I'm getting a little by. hungry, but I'm enjoying this immensely. I haven't told you half the story, but yeah, know, let me let me. Oh, I, do, I will tell you about my. I I eventually during the Jimmy Carter years when the Freedom of Information Act was real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got my file from six different or seven different cities that I had been in in my life. Uh, I asked for my FBI file. Every one of them had one, it, it, except for San Antonio, Texas, which said, well, we have several Henry Cons. Would you tell us what you were doing and why you were here before we send you? Uh, and that, they never complied, but others complied. What I learned was that in the summer Following that summer in Mississippi, when I returned to Harvard, got an apartment with uh, th two roommates, so it was three of us in that place, had my name in the phone book, was matriculated at Harvard Medical School, was giving talks around Boston, what I saw in Mississippi. Okay? My FBI file was filled with teletypes all over Mississippi. Where is he? Come on, a probable agitator, outsider, coming to make trouble, and he's disappeared. We can't find him. We don't know where he's gone. He must be underground. Have you seen him in Hattiesburg? Have you seen him in Biloxi? Have you seen him? My FBI file full of teletypes, panicked agents looking for the con. I had given the report to the FBI that I was getting on an airplane the next morning to go back to Boston go back home to New York State, see my family, and then go to Boston because I'm starting medical school, right? They couldn't put it together. They, I'm, I'm half that, my FBI files add up to about this much, but half of it is teletypes of where I disappeared in Mississippi and they couldn't find me. But they were obviously doing surveillance on me in Mississippi until I wasn't there. <laughs> and they couldn't put it together. And you said that you pulled the information for the six or so cities that you had been in? If I asked my files. That's all and is this because you had traveled, you had lived a lot of yeah. different places after you leave 
medical city. school? No. Um, <coughs> where I lived or been on a project, <coughs> I can't remember which ones they were. They were clearly Boston, probably Poughkeepsie, probably New York City, mm -hmm. um, possibly Durham, North Carolina. I, I can no longer remember which ones. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, San Antonio. When I won my case against the government, the judge wrote a beautiful opinion, immediately commissioned him, and cease and desist. I said this. Uh, the, the, we don't have this on, on record yet, but um, we'll do that after you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the but one, I, I did spend uh, um, much of the summer of 71 in San Antonio. Open, waiting for my commission to come. The commission never didn't come. But it was supposed to, but it didn't come. I said, I've got, a, I've got protection of the federal judge saying, do not investigate me. I'm going to go to San Antonio and set up a coffee house against the war in Vietnam. So I did that. And said, yes. so they said they had lots of Henry Kahn. They didn't know which one I was. Mm -hmm. well, we'll have to revisit that. The one last thing I want to ask before we break. The medical doctors that were working in Mississippi alongside you, what sort of work were they were they doing for not, the movement? Not, not, I mean it like are they visit are they treating the the workers that have come to it work was, in Mississippi? Very mixed or, and it was un, not well defined a priori. See what you can do. We called it medical presence which was basically confidence building. Because there's all these people, many of them young, some of them also sick and some of them maybe old, but mostly it's a young movement. They have no reason to have confidence in the local medical facilities should they get beaten, mm -hmm. should they be traumatized. And they may have mental health problems, which is why I'm delighted to be with Bob Thompson, this wonderful psychiatrist, long history, of working with traumatized Royal Air Force rather <laughs> people from World War II, you know, he he was here to say, mm -hmm. I'm here to help you if you're scared. If you, let's talk through how we can help you. Know uh, if anybody, there were people who freaked out. There were people who had colds. There were people who had minor rashes. There were people who said, and none of them ever got, to my knowledge, got um, burned for practicing without a license. I. I think most of them didn't. Some had licenses in Mississippi, but most of them didn't. Um, it, it's called medical presence. And it had many people in the Freedom Summer movement have thanked them for the confidence instilled. Mm -hmm. we're, we're up against a line of sheriffs and horses, and we'd like to know there's a doctor on our side nearby. Yeah. I need to pee, so I. Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. Uh, Let's I, break, I, have, a, have a snack, and then yeah. reassess. Okay, so we just had a, a little break and, and a snack, and so are now returning to the oral history interview with Henry Kahn as part of the Great Speckleberg Oral History Project. Um, and when we stopped, we're moving towards uh, you relating um, this lawsuit uh, involving your joining the, and help me remember the name, the, the epidemic, it was called Epidemic Intelligence Service. The Epidemic Intelligence Service. I did want to go back and follow up on a couple, couple other points. Um, you had mentioned being involved with uh, a group called Student Health Organizations. Yes. And that they convened a, a conference in Chicago. That was our beginning, and yes. we went for several years thereafter. It's no longer existing. And what, <clears throat> what year was that? The 65. In 65. So it was the fall of 65, the beginning of, for most of us, our second year of medical school. Mm -hmm. And what, what role did you play in, in that coming together and organizing of the conference, and subsequently? Yeah, I was pretty active in... Um, 
maintaining the communications that made it possible to happen and proposing the time and the place. And <clears throat> I, I was, uh, I, I solicited the involvement of Paul W. White as a speaker. Uh, the co-chairs representing East and West Coast because it's looked good, why don't we do that? We mm -hmm. wanted to show the continental involvement. One was my friend Tony Robbins from Yale, who was two years ahead of us in medical school, so he was older than most of the rest of us. And the guy who was our West Coast co-chairman was a year or two ahead of me, likewise. So most of us were in my year entering second year medical school. Some of them were in third or fourth year. The guy on the West Coast was uh, Bill Bronston. Both of them are still close friends. We're all aging, and they're surviving. Um, my role, I, I guess I was just a, an enthusiastic participant. Mm -hmm. It gave me, on arrival in Chicago, I had a chance, well, for the two days I was there, three maybe, <clears throat> to get to know better a mentor who will show up later in this, uh, Quentin Young. He was a grand old man in Cook County Hospital, a private physician, in the period that I knew him, but a perennial attending physician and supervising physician at Cook County, taking care of the poor. He had a private practice with a few partners in the south side of Chicago, but his door was always open to poor people, and he never built most of them. And he had a great reputation in the rising black intellectual community in the south side of Chicago. Among his patients was this state senator named Barack Obama, uh, um, with whom we sat down frequently to talk about what is single-payer health care. Let's figure this out. And it's a very fascinating story. Mm -hmm. But Quentin, as is his, was his want, knew that the student organ students were coming to Chicago to talk about principles and ethics and values and organizing politically, and he made himself available. He threw his house open. He put in some of the bill at the restaurant we all went to, you know, he, he did that kind of stuff. He was a wonderful internist um, who was later uh, an officer in the Medical Committee for Human Rights. He's in that book, and he supported us many ways over. He was also one of the great founders of our more modern group, the <clears throat> Physicians for National Health Program. But all of those activities were downstream consequences of things that Quentin had been doing from the 1940s. Uh, he was a wonderful physician, a caring guy. Uh, another mentor. Yeah. So I got to meet him while I was in medical school. I didn't know him before then, before that trip to Chicago. But thereafter, any time I'd go to a national medical meeting of one of those groups or another, I was always hugs and warm embraces from Quentin Young. Died last year um, in his 90s. Was he one of the the few black members? Or? He's not black. Oh, he's not. Okay. No. Okay. He's um, um, definitely white, humble. Actually, he's from a Jewish background, but it was never part of his persona. He's secular Jew. Um, actually, I went on trips with him. My first trip to Cuba in 1974, he was on a delegation formed by the American Public Health Association. So how does that country do primary care? And it was a wonderful trip. Um, Quentin was part of that. And he pops up over and over again. <clears throat> Any description of left-wing progressive medical movement in the last 30, 40 years has Quentin Young in it. Mm -hmm. as Earl Model. He was a close friend of Jerry Stamler's, who also lived in Chicago. Um, although their intellectual uh, role in medicine is very different, Quentin just took care of people. But, but, but if I have sick patients an hour, if I have to, I'll see them all. I won't go to bed until they're all taken care of. Jerry Stamler was thinking about prevention as an academic arcane, maybe. Science. 
but they were good friends. Jeremiah Stambler is still alive and still kicking, still writing manuscripts on a long yellow pad. <laughs> so, pardon my mistaking of his uh, racial background, were there was there specific intention to reach out to black doctors and medical Absolutely. medical students, and was there much? Well, the good doctors talks about that. Okay, uh, I mean. There really was a wonderful history of a small number of activists among the black physician community who've been agitating around this for years, showing up for things, uh, showing up at MA, AMA conventions saying, why aren't we integrated? Why can't we get hospital privileges here? And they have been, their history has not been adequately um, preserved and presented until a recent project called Power to heal, the power to heal. Three words. That's it's an unfortunate title only because it, it's actually been taken by other people. There's a bunch of uh, quack tours, uh, therapies that call themselves the power to heal, and a, a dreadful book on spiritual healing and stuff. But power to heal is a very credible historical account of how black doctors tried to. Advance medical practice for the poor in America and were rebuffed at every turn, mainly by the AMA but also by the U.S. Congress. And just told them, go away, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. The movie tells how they forced a turn in the corner. I'm not in this movie, I'm not referenced. I have, however, introduced it and presented it several places in Atlanta at Morehouse, at Dan Ray, at CDC. I, I brought the movie there and presented it, The Power to Heal. 1966 was a crucial year when the Medicare Act came into effect and the Civil Rights Act came into effect. I said, you mean the government's going to pay for medical care in hospitals for some people? Yes. And government funds require that to be racially integrated? Yes. Whoa, we didn't see this one coming. So it's a great movie about suddenly they figured out that what these black doctors did the same years is right. And uh, it's a beautiful movie because it brings it together. It's also a book of the same name, whose name, the author is David Barton Smith, B-A-R-T-O-N. I think he considers it one name, Barton Smith, but there's no hyphen in it, so you'll never know. It's either yeah. under Smith or Barton. <clears throat> um, he was a historian, recently pulled together the material and then a, a uh, oral historian from City College from New York pulled together the movie and the footage to make it really, it's a one hour movie, it ran on PBS last year. Mm. Did it run in Atlanta? I don't think so. I have a copy, I, would, I can get it for you if you want. So yeah, the black doctors did play a role and the good doctors talks about that tension. The black doctors have been saying this for years, but now a bunch of these white kids come in and say, you're right, we want to help. And Quentin Young helped bridge that transition. Quentin was close to those black doctors for years, but he was possibly the only white doctor who was. Um, so his reputation among the blacks, professionals in the south side of Chicago was very, including Barack Obama and his wife, who were both his patients when he was an unknown. And they went to him because he was, and he was, so people like him stood as very useful role models. So just chronologically moving through my Harvard years, I left out the fact that I studied Russian while I was there too. I wasn't a Russian major. I was majoring in what called biochemical sciences. It's sort of like a crypto pre-med um, catch-all, but it actually captured what I wanted to do even if I weren't pre-med, but I gradually decided I was pre-med. Um, but I also studied Russian. I had not, I have a good ear for languages. I had studied um, French in high school with a wonderful French teacher who was a European refugee from the 
the fascist Hungarian, but she loved French culture and she spoke beautiful French and she cared about other students um, and facilitated their love lives also, which she should have done in high school. <laughs> but um, I got to college and I said, I guess I should learn some Russian. I mean, if I'm thinking, it would be useful in physics and mathematics, but also to help see what is going on in the Soviet Union, because I was not unaware of the, the importance of the Soviet Union and Russian history and Russian Revolution, but also the possible discomforts that I might run into if I took it to, if I embraced it. I was on my own doing that, but it also applied to my relationship to my father, where I was ignorant, and so was he in those respects. He would read what he wanted to read, and it wasn't always the most accurate, I think. I can't say. I have no hard data on that. So I took Russian. Uh, it was a dreadful class. Focusing at Harvard, they really weren't teaching like that language well. They were teaching old church Slavonic which was interesting to a few medieval scholars who wanted to know that kind of shit. That wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> it didn't do me any good in mathematics or physics and, or in the Russian Revolution, you know. It was very different. But I had the opportunity to have language teachers who actually were old white Russians, and I could hear their point of view. <coughs> they had escaped. <coughs> the Bolsheviks, and they were living out their years in Cambridge, Massachusetts, getting paid a small amount of money to come in and <coughs> talk Russian with the students. Uh, I mean, generals in the White Army and stuff like that is peculiar. I'm sure they're all long dead, but it was interesting. Uh, they didn't care about old church Slavonics, they just wanted us to speak proper Russian, which isn't the same as what they speak now in Russia, but it was interesting. Not really a good course. I took two years and it did well. I passed the exams. I can write Cyrillic letters and I can read the Cyrillic. You know, I can read Russian, but my vocabulary is fading. But I did, in the middle of college, take a 10 year, 10 week um, program paid for by the Carnegie Foundation on Russian immersion. Okay, they wanted. American students of good standing to know Russian. So the requirement was you have to have two years of Russian college, college Russian, and we will take you for 10 weeks into this immersion environment. Five of the weeks will be in Bloomington, Indiana, where there's a very strong Slavic department, and they really do teach Slavic languages well. They really got it. If I were studying Slavic languages, I'd want to go there and then five weeks in the Soviet Union. Um, so the first five weeks, after week one we would, we, through week one we could speak anything, English, you know, go to the cafeteria, speak English. After week one, even in Bloomington, we had a special dining room, we could only speak Russian at meals, we could only speak Russian in the laundry, we could only, you know, it, it was serious stuff. And we did, um, a whole bunch of people of roughly my age that, and then we flew in a propeller plane to the Soviet Union, <laughs> and I crossed the Atlantic in a DC-6, <laughs> stopping along the way in Newfoundland and Ireland, and we just to get gas, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and spent uh, five weeks traveling around the Soviet Union. I did not have a clear idea that the Soviet Union was multicultural. That should have been clearer. Certainly, Russia was Russia. We spent a fair amount of time in Moscow and Leningrad, as it was then called. <clears throat> we also went to Ukraine. We also went to um, Georgia, Wales, Yellow Russia. And uh, our purpose was to learn Russian, so we didn't catch on. We, we no, intellectually. Anyway, uh, but I was pretty fluent in Russian at that point. I could get along with another teenager on the street in Russian quite well. And uh, we went to a lot of wonderful historical things. We got to hear wonderful music. We got to 
meet people on the move. One of our facilitators along the way was Yevgeny Yetushenko, the renowned Russian poet, modern, modern Russian poet, who I believe was probably a lover of our, of our accompanying professor. Um, but we might have tolerated knowing something about a Russian consorting with an American professor as close friends. The idea that they were homosexuals maybe wasn't on their radar, but I think it was the case. Uh, <clears throat> and it wouldn't have been acceptable in Russia any more than it was acceptable here in 1962. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I was comfortable in Russian, but it didn't say much, didn't do much in my political development other than I saw a lot of people. They were well fed. They they were much less prudish than Americans about changing clothes on the beach. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. It was interesting and enjoyable. I got to eat interesting food. I got to see a lot of co-housing that I had never seen. You know, people live in big apartments, big apartment blocks where the your room is small, and you don't maybe have a living room, but you do have a common dining room. Everybody comes down to the common dining room, eats a big pot of soup. Uh, these are working class houses, you know, that kind of stuff. Again, okay, some models, it was interesting. They were not all pretty, but they were, it was interesting. So having that bit of Russian confidence, Russian language competence and confidence, <clears throat> I was terrified. Here's we jump to the present practically in 1989 or 90 it was I guess I'd already visited the Soviet Union on several other occasions trying to do building city to city relationships and de diminishing the risk of war um, but we got word that several of us in the, in the student health organizations the, including Tony Robbins the friend from Yale medical school who was had been a, was an active public health physician all his life at government levels, working for the U.S. Congress as a health aide to Senate Congressman Dingell and do other that kind of stuff. He said, "We're hearing that the Soviet Union has legislation pending to convert to a for-profit private healthcare system. What do you think?" <coughs> we all said, <coughs> "We know it's not great in the Soviet Union, but this will make it worse." <coughs> Long story short, it did make it worse. But we <coughs> framed ourselves as a group of consultants to go, American physicians saying, do not emulate what we do here. We think it'd be a big mistake. We'd be happy to talk about ways to build your social system toward a better end and a better process, because there are problems, we know that. We have problems here, our problems are worse than yours structurally. We have more money, but structurally it's worse here. So we, um, six or seven of us spent several weeks in the Soviet Union as guests of the health ministry, consulting with them. <clears throat> Do they really want to convert to a for-profit system? Our position was clear. Do not do this. They didn't believe us. Uh, if I may act, if I can replicate what I heard, I, I spoke in Russian at the Supreme Soviet, not the whole Supreme Soviet, just the Health Committee. But I had prepared myself and gave the talk in Russian about why I thought this wasn't going to work. And then they said back, acknowledging my poor Russian, I guess. They said back to me in English, one of the senior doctors on all of these were rich doctors. They were beneficiaries of the corruption of the Soviet system. They had corruption, there's no question about it, but every bit the place does is these privileged guys saying, Thank you very much for your quaint socialist perspective. We have moved beyond socialism now. We are going to adopt a more modern system. You drive a Cadillac, we only drive a Ford. And we want to drive a Cadillac. That's, that's basically what they told me. And everything they said happened. And they, they wanted. And the Soviet Union is the only major country in the world where the health statistics have gotten worse since 1990. 
everywhere else, things are creeping better. We predicted it. So I was on that group, <clears throat> trying to warn the Soviet authorities not to go there. They didn't want to hear from us. They characterized us as quaint socialists. They were right. <laughs> we were right. Their characterization was right. I guess you can't expect the health system to do things that are excellent in the absence of excellence in the rest of the governmental and social support system. You can't have excellent subway lines and dismal infrastructure and everything else. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 there will be a crunch somewhere. We wanted them to have an excellent healthcare system while they were still struggling to make socialism work. Um, and they, they didn't even want to make socialism work. They, I had already met with Russians and other things and social events, <clears throat> and guys who had Communist Party credentials would come up to say, So, I, uh, this is my third time in New York. I would like to do some business. Who can I talk to to do some business in the York? This is before the collapse of the Soviet Union. These communists looking to make investments and move money. And, uh, it was unfortunate uh, exposure. I, I will preserve my principles as best I can, and I think I need to, when nuclear weaponry is poised to come into action on the horizon. I can do what I can to make sure we're all talking, <laughs> but it doesn't make me happy to see socialists, self-professed socialist communists saying, I want to do business. They mean profit, that's what they meant, yes. So struggles are, <clears throat> for those who in the past insisted that we were held forward by Moscow gold. <laughs> None of that could possibly be true. Um, there, there you have it. So there's a bridge there. <clears throat> With the help of, uh, let's see, 1987, I went to the, I went to Soviet Georgia. At that point, I was figuring, realizing this is a different republic as before the Soviet Union fell apart. But Soviet Georgia, because it's called Georgia, we thought it would be a good place to have a sister city relationship. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, not technically. It didn't come to much, but we invited Soviet Georgian physicians and scientists and professors to come here. And some of us went there uh, to meet people and uh, built a sense of trust exposed me to the same problem with me, some people over there who were very privileged and didn't reflect what I thought would have been a preferable socialist <clears throat> posture about taking care of everybody. You know, I'd be surprised. You just have to meet with the Georgia legislature, the legislator once or twice, to realize how privileged our ruling class is and <clears throat> how uh, Little they are concerned with the welfare of common people. Right. There are exceptions, of course, but yeah. so now I think I've gotten you through most of my college education and into medical school. In the middle of medical school, the summer of '66, I got a, funded through the Harvard School of Public Health to spend the summer in Colombia. Spanish. I never studied Spanish, but living with Mickey, who was a Spanish major and who had a lot of experience in Mexico, I had picked up Spanish. We, on some occasion, we would speak Spanish because she knew I wanted to learn and she would be talking to her Spanish friends. Um, anyway, I was no longer Mickey's partner at that point, um, but I did go to Colombia. 
funds from the Harvard School of Public Health paid for a few weeks of Spanish tutor before we went, but it amounted to very little except, you know, basic. Here are some of the funny, the tildes on the letters, and here are some of the few details about Colombian cuisine, and, and you know, stuff like that. that um, didn't make much difference, but I went with three other medical students from my class. <clears throat> they wanted to just get an apartment in Bogota and have a good time. I was in favor of a good time, but I didn't think we would have it and learn Spanish if we were just living with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. So I begged off that plan, and I went out on my own and just found a rooming house with in Bogota, where I was the only gringo. You know, everybody else was Colombian. Um, a salesman, a graduate student or two, uh, a couple of technicians of different kinds, living in a, I guess it was all men, a pension on the side street. It was comfortable. We had a big dining room in it. If you get there at the right time to get a breakfast, you could have some lunch. Or you get lunch or sometimes supper, you know. And I got comfortable in Colombian Spanish. God knows which is not the same as Puerto Rican or Cuban, but <clears throat> it was good. I, I made me confident in becoming a medical student, taking care of Hispanics more than I would have been. And, and later in the experience I had with the 37 other elite medical graduates going to the South Bronx of New York City, where all our patients were Puerto Rican, well, 80%, maybe 75, 80% were Puerto Ricans. <clears throat> and then the rest were black, very poor blacks, hardly anybody else. I served me well. I extended my linguistic ability from Colombian Spanish, it's very clean and slow and graceful, to Puerto Rican and Dominican and Cuban Spanish, which is different. Mm -hmm. uh, but they may be interested in going to Cuba too, which I subsequently. So uh, that was an important part yeah. of my development, just to get to know <clears throat> third world country pretty much on the inside. I, I, we were not staying in, I was not staying in a five star hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I was in a lower middle class environment, adequately comfortable for a, um, a healthy young man. And, and were you uh, like oh, I sort of interning at a clinic or something? Uh, I was in the laboratory. The, Instituto Nacional de Nutrición. It, it was a research group that studied nutrition for the masses. <clears throat> it was actually a front for Nestle and the United Fruit Company. I didn't figure that out until I'd been there for a while. Um, but it, I got what I wanted. We, you know, we took seminars, we did some laboratory work, and we got support to go out into the barrios and, and collect data. families and found how often this my epidemiology thinking is already moving. I hadn't taken the course yet. So, whoa, these kids, this family has lots of diarrhea. You know, and I could link it to the fact that mother was diluting the commercial lactation formula with street water that should never have been, you know. And then she'd stop breastfeeding at six weeks or two weeks or whatever, you know. That was actually not understood. I, I made that observation and wrote it up in a memo. I never published it. It was not scientific quality, but it was a clear case. For these 12 families, the kids who get diarrhea are the kids who don't have breast milk. You know, it's a cliche now, but I, yeah. I got to see it, and everybody thought, that's strange. Oh, interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I got to travel around. They weren't the demands on me were not great. I got to do things that I wanted to do. I like walking around the city, but I had weekends to myself, and air travel in Colombia is wonderful, or it was then. I can't speak for it now, but it was cheap. <coughs> it was a very large airport in Bogota, and civil aviation that goes back to the German immigrants of the 1920s, so they've had civil aviation working for a long time. 
going out to little villages, I would just go to the airport, little knapsack, and a couple hundred colonists in my pocket, and see, where's the plane going now? I get a ticket on. I think I'll go to Kutta. Mm. Okay, that's going to be a 40 minute flight. Mm. Pretty neat. I'll find a place to stay. Go for the weekend, get to see these little villages. You know, go there, hear another accent, hear, see a different kind of food. It's a, it was fun. I had a wonderful time. But that wasn't medical school. That was an add on, you know, in the just for the summer. <clears throat> but useful. It gave me experience in third world and improved my Spanish greatly. Um, and showed you yet another type of political and social system. Yeah, I actually went to demonstrations then, but I didn't do it much and I didn't go there out of knowledge, but I was in downtown Bogota, not in between two universities. There was plenty of activity and the FARC was just getting started, I don't know if you know. Mm -hmm. the, the FARC, I wanted to identify with these people, I didn't know much about them. At no point in the 10 weeks I lived in Colombia did I ever hear the word cocaina. And, and I was in the young men's community, you know. It, I saw lots of peasants chewing coca leaves. That was, I mean, they were probably rural people, but there they were in downtown Bogota chewing little leaves. I mean, that's something else. Yeah, that's coca leaves. <laughs> With coca leaves. Um, but um, the cocaine epidemic had, had uh, industry was way below my radar. I don't think it was, I've told much more recently, um, just a little bit more recently than that. that it's always a big deal in, in Colombia now, but it wasn't then. <clears throat> so. Well, I see that Catherine has appeared and we're just okay. after three and so you have, I have an appointment. So Yeah, um, well, I'll try. I hope I have an appointment. <laughs> Right. So we will wrap here for the day, and then we'll schedule, and then within the next couple of weeks, we'll yeah. we'll have another session. Thank you so much. Andy. No, your, thank you. Your gentleness and your profound sympathy uh, and interest is wonderful. I'm. You are an easy, easy interviewee. You've got great, great information. <coughs> I'm I'm privileged to be part of it. Great. Thank you. So...